64 teams will get the regionals underway, 16 regional sites around the country. You need three wins to advance to the Super Regionals next weekend. Everything in Omaha gets underway on June 15th at TD Ameritrade Park. Our bracket here in Atlanta features the number three national seed, Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Georgia Tech in action later on tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern start on ESPN app against Florida A&M out of the MEAC. And with that, we welcome you in. Steve Lennox, Rusty Enzer, my partner, all SEC in 1981 with the Tennessee Volunteers. And Rusty, we were here for practice yesterday for all four of these teams. Now the lights are on and we are ready to play baseball. Well, I'll tell you, Steve, this has a chance to be a very offensive regional. Georgia Tech, Coastal, Florida A&M all swinging the bats really well right now. Auburn finished 11th in the SEC in batting average. But remember, this is a team that played in a super last year. Some of the great storylines that we have here in Atlanta. Danny Hall's Yellow Jackets in action later. News and notes. And the Yellow Jackets in action later tonight. They've been to the they've been to Omaha three times during their school history. They're in the regionals for the 21st time under head coach Danny Hall. Again, Auburn has struggled at the bats, but will the postseason produce any magic for the Tigers? Coastal Carolina won it all in Omaha in 2016 under head coach Gary Gilmore. They have four players on this year's roster that won rings in Omaha. And FAMU, a scrappy team, Jamie Shoup's club won five games in four days to win the MEAC. And we talked about offense, Butch Thompson's Auburn Tigers. They've been looking for offense for some of their top hitters that they were expecting big things from this year. Edouard Julian, one of the hitters in the lineup, who really hasn't had a great sophomore year. But I tell you, his freshman year was outstanding. He hit 17 home runs for the Auburn Tigers last year. It's been a struggle at times this year, but he needs his bat to come alive, Butch Thompson and the Auburn Tigers. He hit 300 in the SEC tournament last weekend. Coastal Carolina, they bring the bats, Rusty. 87 home runs as a team this year. They really brought the bats last week in the Sun Belt tournament. A lot of talk about launch angle and exit velocity. Well, we're going to see it this weekend. Last weekend in the Sun Belt, Coastal banged out 90 hits, scored 80 runs, hit 18 home runs. Steve, this could be fun today. Won five straight games after losing the opener in the Sun Belt Conference. We are set for baseball here in Atlanta, Coastal Carolina, Auburn. First pitch coming up next. Good afternoon here in Atlanta, Georgia. Game time temperature for game one of two, right around 84 degrees. Coastal Carolina and Auburn are first of two. Number three national seed, Georgia Tech and Florida AM. 7 p.m. first pitch tonight from Rush Chandler Stadium. That game will be available on the ESPN app. Jack Owen, left-hander out of Alicio Viejo, California, gets a start for the Tigers against Coastal. Four and two on the season is Jack Owen. Here's his scouting report. Going to be a fastball between the A789. Has sneaky stuff, kind of a touch field left-hander. Most will work the corners in and out and control the pace. Coastal had a monster Sun Belt tournament. They also run well. 878 stolen bases. That's the second most in the Sun Belt. So the lefty probably keeps the running game at least somewhat in check. Corey Wood, the leadoff hitter for Coastal Carolina. 68 hits on the year. Takes the first strike. And we are underway. A look at Gary Gilmore's lineup with the leadoff hitter. And then he's got the big bats behind him, Zach Bierman, the cleanup hitter, one of the big guys with plenty of pop. Butch Thompson going with the lefty, Owen in the opener. This powerful lineup, as you see from Coastal, features four lefties. Wood has two home runs on the season, 28 driven, and he has stolen 19 bases. Guy who gets on base at a fairly high successful rate. Breaking ball from Jack Owens, taken for ball two. You know, Owen coming into this game, you know, again, he's not an overpowering lefty, 55 innings pitch, but he has punched out 51 batters. Extremely tough against lefties, too. Count remains, two balls and two strikes on the leadoff man here in the top of the first inning. Watch the setup from Owen. He'll set up on the first base side of the rubber, which makes it very difficult against the lefties because that release point is going to start out behind you if, if you're the batter. Owen continues to battle against Corey Wood.
Wood from Raleigh, North Carolina. In 2017, the junior was a Sun Belt Freshman of the Year. Was first team all Sun Belt last year in 2018. Spoils one foul. This is what you love as a leadoff hitter. Gary Gilmore, he can see the rest of the lineup in the dugout and on deck with Keaton Rivers. They're seeing I mean, all this the is, pitches early I mean, on. You're right. Steve, this is a great A-B to lead off this regional. Making Owen throw a lot of pitches. Fouls back the breaking ball, stays at 2-2, two and two, and that one was above the letters, almost eye level. Yeah, that's the one I think that if Wood had back, he'd like to drive that one into left center field. That was right there on a platter. Owen got away with one there. Butch Thompson going with Jack Owen on day one here in Atlanta. Tanner Burns were anticipating getting the start in game two, which will be Saturday. We'll see if it's going to be in the winner's bracket or on the loser's side. Three ball, two count, uh, two count, three and two on Wood. Put together, already a strong at bat here against the starter, Jack Owen, who missed time during the year, right at the start of SEC play with shoulder soreness. This is the 10th pitch of the at bat to the leadoff man, Corey Wood. And we'll see an 11th pitch. I mean, just a great A-B. You know, another note about Burns you mentioned that that's going to pitch tomorrow night, whether it's in the winner or the loser's bracket, it's a it's an arm that everybody wants to tune in to watch because it's going to be a top pick in next year's draft. Hold foul outside of first base. And even early on, the fans can sense this battle between the hitter Wood and the pitcher Owen. I mean, this, this epitomizes this coastal team, Steve. It's We're seeing just, it right from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it's it's gritty, it's gutty, they battle. It's an impressive bunch. Sharply hit, second baseman, Bliss takes care of it. Wood retired, but a lengthy at bat. Let's take a look at the Chanticleers and how they got to the regional. Gary Gilmore, the head coach of the Chanticleers, 35-24 and one record, 15 and 13 in the Sun Belt, won the conference tournament last weekend, and they did it the hard way by losing on day one and rattled off five straight wins. Well, because of the RPI, Gary Gilmore said they had to win the tournament in order to get in a regional. He has done a tremendous job, over 1,200 wins in his career. Keaton Rivers at the plate, right fielder for Coastal. 327 hitter on the area, and he is the first of, let's count again, five straight batters with 10 or more home runs on the year. He's got 13. Off the front of the third base dugout and foul. Sunbelt Tournament most outstanding player. Put up some big numbers. Bierman, the cleanup hitter, had five home runs, but Rivers, ten hits, six extra base hits, including four homers. And Coastal, in its third year in the Sun Belt, hosted the Sun Belt Conference Tournament in Conway, South Carolina. Owen could serve himself well getting the number two hitter here quickly after that lengthy at bat against the leadoff man, Wood, and he evens the count at two and two. Called strike three, two down. That's a great pitch. Saw a lot of soft stuff Rivers did away early in the at-bat. Finishes, finishes him off with a fastball right inside on the black. It's a great job of the pitch sequence by the Auburn left-hander. Base is empty for the designated hitter, Jake Wright, who stands in. Jack Owen getting the start in game number one. He took a no decision. Butch Thompson talking to us yesterday. Last year, they were one win away from advancing to Omaha, lost in the Gainesville Regional, two games to one to the Gators. This year, at Hoover, losing that game against LSU where the tying oh. run scored on a wild pitch from third and the winning run scored on the throw to the plate that got away from the catcher. It's just kind of a microcosm of, of their season this year. It's just been a struggle. It's been up and down. Auburn just won four SEC series. But to lose a game, I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. Two runs scored on a wild pitch. 
It was just uh, it, it was a heartbreaking loss, but the good news for Auburn, they got a chance to redeem themselves not only in this regional but today. Butch Thompson is his fourth year as the head coach of the Auburn Tigers and talked about having the guts pulled out on multiple occasions and believes that's the way you start to build the culture and the program. Still, just in his fourth year, that continues to build. Well, three straight regional appearances, too, for Butch Thompson, which is huge for recruiting. I mean, and, and, and it's not easy to get to a regional, especially out of the SEC, when you have so many at uh, 10 teams in the NCAA tournament for the second straight year, and it's such a 30-game grind in that league. But Butch Thompson, who has been in this league for a very long time, years ago he was the pitching coach at Auburn. He also was the pitching coach not only at Georgia but also at Mississippi State. Considered one of the top pitching coaches in all of college baseball, also one of the top recruiters as well. The pitch to Wright, sharply hit, past the second baseman Bliss, and Jake Wright, a two-out base hit. Auburn Tigers again out of the SEC, one of ten SEC schools in the field of 64 here in 2019. Butch Thompson, the Tigers, since early 2000. This is their third straight. It's the first time they've been in three straight regionals since the early 2000s, and A lot of it getting in on the strength of schedule this year, and that happens to be in the SEC Western Conference where they play some big-time opponents. I mean, it's a gauntlet in the SEC West. That you know, the Tigers started five and two this year. Steve then reeled off 15 in a row. They swept Cincinnati, which is an NCAA tournament team. Swept Tennessee and Auburn for the SEC opener, which is also an NCAA tournament team. Beat Ole Miss in a series, which is hosting. But that number one strength of schedule, it was uh, it was a gauntlet. I think I think they played 36 of the top 50 RPI teams this year. Beerman, 17 home runs, 76 runs batted in, and Jack Cohen already up to 25 pitches. First hitter of the ball game, Corey Woods saw 12 pitches during his at bat, and he ended up grounding out to the second baseman. They pitch Beerman away there. The second baseman, Bliss, out on the outfield grass, deep in the hole on the right side of the infield. Well, here at Russ Chandler Stadium, you can see a little bit of that on on the right side of your screen. There's a bunch of big, tall Leland Cypress trees. Beerman was just wearing those guys out in batting practice. Pitch catches the corner. That's a good take. Still got one left. He's going to be forced probably to use the entire field. If he throw, if Owen throws it inside, it's a mistake, I guarantee you. Goes away, picks up the strikeout, second of the inning. And Coastal Carolina turned away, no runs ahead. Auburn coming to the plate in the bottom of the first when we come back. Chanticleers did not score in the top of the first inning against Jack Owen. Coastal Carolina lefty Anthony Veneziano out of New Jersey gets a start for the Shunts here in game one against Auburn. Veneziano, 6'5", lefty, has five wins on the season, 74 innings pitched. He has punched out 80 batters, walked just 28. Feature a fastball 91 to 93. He can tick up to the mid 90s. He will have arm side life. The change is plus, probably a second best pitch, and he needs to pitch big. It's an important arm. He had two starts last week in the Sun Belt Tournament, 128 pitches in five days. Starting lineup for the Auburn Tigers, and we highlight the leadoff hitter, Judd Ward. Ward, the leadoff man, 62 hits on the year. He'll be followed by Ryan Bliss and Connor Davis. Holland, Julian, and Williams are the three batters they really want to get going here in Atlanta. We touched on that in the open. Yeah, those three batters combined to hit 41 home runs last year. They were key in getting the Tigers to the Supers against Florida, as we talked about earlier. Veneziano, 62 hits, high chopper towards shortstop. McKeon comes in, holds on to it, and Ward aboard for the leadoff face hit. His 63rd hit on the season. Tigers in business here in the first. Well, Ward's been that catalyst in the lineup. He had a really good SEC tournament, hit a home run against Tennessee, and 
the opener on Tuesday. That high chop, her speed puts pressure on the defense. That's why Ward's batting at the in the one hole for Butch Thompson's team. Ryan Bliss, 57 hits on the season, a pair of home runs, 32 driven in. Auburn's second baseman against a lefty, Anthony Veneziano. Throw to first base and just back in safely as Ward. He was leaning the other way. Crown Nunmaker comes over. I think this was his A move. Well, <laughs> you know, he's he's leaning back towards first base, but he he didn't think he was coming that way of that little hesitation. He got, you know, he did the right thing. He reached for that back corner of the bag, so that's the farthest that Beerman has to go with the swipe tag. So technically that that part of it was uh, spot on for Owen. Or, excuse, excuse me, for Ward. Veneziano thought he had him. Toss over. And see, I think what Ward's trying to do right there, Steve, I think he's trying to draw a throw. I think they're trying to get an early read on the on the move that the big lefty has. You know, he's leaning towards second, but I don't think he's going. I think they're just trying to draw a throw. Veneziano falls behind 2 and nothing on Bliss. Plus, that puts a little extra attention to the runner at first base, and you see – Quickly, Bliss up in the count. He's got count leverage now at 2-0. and oh. If you're going to hit and run, this would be a good pitch to do it on. Base hit, right field. Ward will go to second and hold there, back-to-back singles. And the table setters, Ward and Bliss, doing their jobs perfectly. Good start for Auburn. Bliss uses the entire field extremely well. He's a very good two-hole hitter. That The one-two punch of Ward and Bliss is really outstanding for Auburn. That's a good combination. And now you got a, a power bat coming up in Davis. Davis, 290 hitter on the season, a home run. Or six home runs, pardon me, 32 driven in. Gary Gilmore telling us when we spoke with him yesterday, Anthony Veneziano grew up in New Jersey and was a standout on the hardwood. Terrific basketball player at the high school level. You can see with the frame, 6'5", 205. Nowadays, that's a shooting guard or a small forward. <laughs> or it could be a point guard these days. Well, I mean, he's got the perfect size for, from a professional standpoint at the next, next level. So you he talked about arm side life. What's yeah. that mean? Well, arm side life meaning uh, – it, to the hitter in, in Connor Davis on the outside corner. He's going to have some run and some tail on that side. That was a good view of it right there. That two-seam fastball, it's going to have it's going to tail away from the right-handed hitter. So if Davis gets pull happy on that outside corner, you know, he's just he's just going to either roll it over or make connection on the end of the bat. So he's got to stay closed. Average-wise, he's Auburn's best hitter. Tigers don't have any starter over 300. Count stays, two strikes on Davis. Will Holland, the cleanup hitter on deck. It's been a little bit of a struggle lately for Davis, just four for his last 23. However, he did have a pair of hits, went two for five with a double in the SEC tournament against LSU. And he's not alone No, when it comes to guys scuffling one through nine in the lineup for Auburn. But once you get to postseason play, regional play, everything's wiped clean. That's that tailing fastball right there. It's a great 0-2 pitch. It's up in the zone. If you're if you're Davis, you have to expand with two strikes. Watch the arm side life I was talking about right there. That's a big, big out for Coastal. Veneziano picks up the strikeout as Davis was going back to the dugout. Holland was making his way to the plate. Holland at least asked one question. Not sure what the answer was from Davis, of course. And then Scheffler, who's now on deck, asked something as well. So trying to get a little bit more on the scouting report, I would imagine. Well, you know, this is, these are a couple of key base runners out there. you got a runner in scoring position. An early lead for Auburn would be good. You get in these situations during conference tournament play, which wrapped up last Sunday. 
for several conferences around the nation. Now you get into the regional round. So much is under the microscope, and that one little play, that one pitch that misses, everything is just that more magnified in these situations. And you talk about first and second, nobody out situation right here. Auburn, now with one down, you really you want to see them come through. Fly ball, right center field. Shavers over in the alley. Right near the warning track, makes the catch. Tagging Ward, he'll move to third base. And now first and third with two away as Holland is retired. Holland, one of those bats in the lineup, 240 hitter on the year. And now it's going to be up to the backstop, Matt Scheffler. Scheffler at 274 on the year. Veneziano giving up an infield hit and then a line single off the bat of Bliss. Two on. And nobody out. This could be a shot in the arm for the Shanta Clears if he can leave two stranded right here. Junior college transfer from Kirkland, Washington. Oh, they got a ball. Ward will score. Auburn up 1 0. And Veneziano knew it right when it happened. Watch it right here. See, he started to go into the stretch, stopped, and he knew it, stepped off. That's a balk. That's an easy first run for Auburn. Scheffler, the hitter, was pointing at the pitcher, trying to help out the four umpire crew, four-man umpiring crew. Now a runner at second. Fly ball down the left field line. Piercy gives a look, and this one out of play. Scheffler, the JUCO transfer, Started two of the three games in the SEC tournament for Auburn. Had a hit in each game. It's a pretty big run out there on second base. You know, everything as you mentioned, Steve, everything's magnified. So two out hitting, extremely important, especially for a team like Auburn where runs really come at a premium. Spins towards second, trying to keep the runner Bliss close. Auburn won, Coastal Carolina nothing. Game two later tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern start time here in Atlanta. Georgia Tech and Florida A&M on the ESPN app. In the dirt, good read by the runner, Bliss. He'll take off and go in standing to third base. Excellent, excellent base running by Bliss. And it all starts with the aggressive secondary lead. He reads the ball in the dirt. Doesn't hesitate, takes the extra 90 feet. A lot easier to score that second run if you're Bliss from third than it is from second. Good base running. Two, two pieces of base running in this inning for, for Auburn. Ward tagging up on that deep fly ball. Base hit left field, 2-0 Auburn. Scheffler comes through with a single that scores Bliss. Well, I tell you, if any team needed something good to happen early in a game, it's Auburn. It was talked about a lot at the SEC tournament. It's been talked about a lot by us so far in this game. And uh, Auburn jumps out to a quick 2-0 lead. That is really important. Confidence from an offensive standpoint is key for this Auburn club. Edouard Julian, sophomore, at the plate against a lefty. Anthony Veneziano, 2 0. Tigers here in the first. Looking for more. Julian going up there, first pitch swinging. 236 average on the season. Rusty touched on his numbers in our open. Last year, he broke Auburn's freshman record for runs batted in with 69. Broke the record of Hall of Famer Frank Thomas. This year, 48 runs batted in. That's still an impressive number, but down in the count, nothing at two. But I'm sure Butch Thompson, as soon as last year ended with the loss in Gainesville, was saying, okay, Williams, Holland, Julian, they're all coming back. You know, we're expecting at least those numbers, if not more. Puts pressure on guys, but sure. Uh, I mean, and you're right. I mean, those three guys combined for 41 home runs, drove in 172 this year, 23 home runs, 99 runs batted in. Off the glove, the catcher skills, and Scheffler will move to second base. Pass ball on the catcher, the seventh of the season for Kyle Skeels. And now another runner in scoring position, and they've done this all with two outs. 
Just a touch on Julian again to put a bow on what you were talking about last year's RBIs. Those 69 most by a freshman nationally. Called strike three, inning over. The damage is done. Auburn, two runs. They leave a runner stranded. We go to the second. Two nothing Tigers here in Atlanta. Auburn up 2-0 over Coastal Carolina. The Auburn family has been in mourning this past week after the voice of the Tigers, Rod Bramlett, and his wife Paula were killed in a car accident last Saturday. Prior to the game, a moment of silence for the Bramlets. Rod was a lead broadcaster for Auburn baseball from 1993. Took over as a lead announcer for Auburn in 2003. Started in baseball in 1993, the Auburn hitters. And on the hats, you see the RB with the microphone. Uh, swings enough drive to deep left field. That one's gone. That one's gone. Auburn wins. Auburn wins. Auburn wins. Auburn wins. And we are thinking of Rod and his wife Paula. Rod in 1993 began as the voice of Auburn Tiger baseball, took over as their lead voice on football, men's basketball, and baseball in 2003. Rusty, you're familiar with the SEC, talked with Mike Morgan, Tom Hart this week, Tom on the phone, and you know, they both crossed paths with him. And uh, you can, Butch Thompson wears his heart on his sleeve. Yep. And from Butch all the way through, um, George Nunnally, who was their SID, everyone feeling it this week. It's been a difficult week for the Auburn family, no doubt. Uh, I knew Rod uh, from my days covering the SEC and doing a handful of Auburn games and his partner, Andy Burcham, uh, who unfortunately is not here this weekend calling the Auburn uh, baseball games. He is back home uh, in Auburn. Hopefully, Andy, you're watching. I just want you to let you know that uh, we're all thinking about you. Rod and Andy just celebrated their 25th year as partners with Auburn baseball. And uh, Andy is certainly, uh, Andy and Rod both great professionals, great broadcasters. Andy's a good friend. Kyle Skeels, leadoff base hit. Paul Allen, Britt Bowen are carrying the Auburn broadcast. I'm sure it's not easy for them on day one here at Atlanta as well. And I'm sure they're gonna do a fantastic job making Rod proud. Leadoff base hit by Skeels. Parker Shavers, the center fielder at the plate for Coastal Carolina, down 2 0 here in the second inning. Like you said, Andy is someone you know well. You consider him a friend. And yeah. Not easy. Um, one of those moments, I don't know when you found out the information and, and found out about the story from last Saturday night. I was actually in Bristol working up in Bristol, Connecticut, and I was wrapping up a shift. And the story came over. Paul and Britt, Paul, Ellen, and Britt Bowen on Auburn Radio. And it was just the beginning of the story. And at first, it sounded like Paula was the worst, and they were being medevaced out. And anytime you read that in a story, and then the next morning back at work and heard that Rod had passed as well. And we want you to think not only of them, but also their two children, and perhaps beyond. Owen working with a 2-0 lead here in the second. Breaking ball fouled back. Shavers, the last of five straight hitters in order, two through six, with 10-plus home runs. It's a big number for Coastal Carolina. Pulls one foul towards the first base dugout, scatters a couple of teammates. And in Conway, South Carolina, their home ballpark, where they hosted the Sun Belt Conference Tournament. Breeze coming right off the Atlantic Ocean. If that breeze is blowing out, hitters delight. Breeze is blowing in, you want to be on the pitcher's mound on that particular day. Owen to Shavers, misses inside. And you saw that graphic a second ago on, on Shavers. He's from Montgomery, Alabama. 
So a little extra giddy up, I think, in this game today for Parker Shavers, who, when he was in high school, had the idea of playing for Auburn. It's from Montgomery, hit 402 as a junior, so he got on Auburn's radar. But Auburn instead signed Stephen Williams and Judd Ward. So Auburn's loss has been Coastal's gain. Last year, Shavers hit 323 with seven home runs. This year, 325, 13 bombs, 52 runs batted in. All three of those numbers would lead Auburn right now. First team all Sun Belt, Sun Belt all tournament team last week in Conway. Pop up around home plate. Oh, and the pitcher is coming in, and he'll make the catch. You do not see that often. But Owen heads up there, realized Scheffler looking up into that high sky and had to turn around and did not locate it right away. Yeah, you're right. You don't see that often. But, you know, that's heads up by Jack Owen right there because he knows. You you can see right there Scheffler didn't see it at first, but nice hustle. You don't want to rely on your third baseman, which it's probably an easier play for Julian coming in from third. He's coming in on the play. But but Owen hustling. Did you see Scheffler? You yeah. get rid of the mask, but he got rid of it in the direction at the feet of the pitcher who was coming in. Yeah, you could have actually tripped over that mask. That could have been a disaster. One out, McKeon. Scott McKeon at the plate. Three home runs, 36 driven in. 82 hits for McKeon on the year. From Raleigh. Auburn, two in the first. One of 16 regionals around the nation. Look out, that back goes all the way to the backstop and just clipped the top of the screen, ends up on the warning track back behind home plate, and McKeon is going to have to retrieve his own bat. To say that he is swinging a hot bat right now might be an understatement. Last nine games, he's hitting 415, scored 13 runs out of the seven hole, so you see where he ranks. In the Sun Belt, lots of speed at the bottom third of that order with five triples. Florida State, Florida Atlantic, and Athens, one of three games underway. Noon Eastern here on the first Friday of the regional round. Campbell, North Carolina State, also in action. Florida State making it for the 42nd straight year and 40th straight under head coach Mike Martin. Good pitch there. McKeon takes it for ball two. I tell you, if the game plan the first time through the order was to take some pitches, make the pitcher work, check goes next to the box for Coastal. 42 pitches already and not even out of the second inning. Into center field and a base hit. So McKeon moves skills up to second. And now three hits for Coastal Carolina. They have two on with one down. Well, here's the thing about Coastal. No lead is safe for Auburn. If anybody has the threat in the lineup of a three-run home run, it would be (laughs) the shit clears. Earl Weaver would love watching this ball club. Yeah. The shots again, 87 home runs on the year, and It's a big number. Tied for fourth best in the nation. And 18 of those over the course of the Sun Belt Tournament. So they weren't really in the top five conversation in terms of home runs as a team in 2019 until last weekend with the 18 total. Bierman had five. Five different players had at least two. Owen struck out two in the first inning. Ahead, nothing in two. On Mike Koenig, Gary Gilmore guided the Chanticleers to the NCAA College World Series Championship in 2016. Went through Raleigh. Then the Super Regional Round was at LSU in Baton Rouge. Then got to Omaha and took care of business. That was a great run by Coastal in 2016. And we talk about SEC, ACC, Big 12, Pac-12, Big 10 has five teams this year, but 
great to see a team that's not in those power fives make it and, and make a strong run. Well, I, th- I think it's in, great for the game. And you were in Raleigh during that regional, so you saw the, the first part of that postseason run. Towards third base, Julian on the grass. Retires Koenig, two down. Skills moves to third base, and McKeon moves up to second. Tigers got some timely two-out runs in the bottom half of the first inning against Anthony Veneziano. Now Coastal looking to do the same with two down in second and third. Yeah, we left there. Did that regional in 2016 with Wes Clements, and you, it was just a feeling. Now, would anyone have predicted even winning the Raleigh Regional and going seven? And winning against North Carolina State and, and Elliott Avent's team? No, but you thought they'd give LSU a run. They went there. They won the best two out of three Super Regional Series in Baton Rouge. And, again, there was rain. There were, there were players in that lineup. There were seniors. And they just played together. And that was a common theme with the coaches that we talked to yesterday. Played together, understanding this might be the final time that you're together as a team. And Coastal had that in 2016 with a lot of players on their roster. Yeah, it was an amazing run, and they won six elimination games in the postseason to win the national championship as well. So when it was on the line, that that man right there has been the leader of this program, and he has taken it certainly to the next level. See that 16 NCAA tournament appearances, three supers. A lot, of, a lot of people think they're maybe the most dangerous three seed in the tournament this year. Pierce, he was second and third. On the ground towards shortstop. Will Holland fires across, side retired. Owen strands a pair, middle of the second. Auburn two, Coastal Carolina nothing here in Atlanta. The NCAA Baseball Regionals is presented by Capital One. What's in your wallet? And in part by new Extra Refreshers Gum. Give extra, get extra. And Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Beautiful afternoon here in Atlanta, Georgia. Glad you're with us. Coastal Carolina, Auburn, 2 0. Tigers lead. Steve Lennox, Rusty Enzer will be with you all weekend long. There'll be a game seven Monday if necessary. Need three wins in your regional bracket to advance to the Super Regionals, which will take place next week at host sites. We'll go from 64 down to a number after this weekend. Get to eight in Omaha. 64 down to 16, and then eight, then four, then two. Everything gets underway in Omaha on June 15th. Best two out of three championship series with similar format in Omaha with the two 14 brackets. And you can lose once in a regional. You can lose once in a super regional. And then you can lose up to two games in Omaha and still end up with the title. You know, the key once you get to Omaha, since you played basically every other day, if you stay in that winner's bracket, you can really set up your pitching. And that is a huge advantage for the teams that can do that. Rankin Welly, first baseman, out on strikes, one down. Third strikeout for Veneziano. For more coverage of the Division I Baseball Regionals and interactive brackets, go to NCAA.com. All games available on the ESPN app. Wally out on strikes. Here is Stephen Williams. We've touched on Holland and Julian, and here is Williams, another sophomore who's had a down south, uh, sophomore campaign. 227 batting average takes up an in for ball one. Just four hits in his last 30 at bats. That includes the SEC tournament. Yeah, 291 last year. He was actually rated as the number two catcher coming out of the state of Georgia. Number three by perfect game in the country as far as a high school catcher. Right now they've got him playing right field, and Skeels takes one off the, I don't know if it's the throwing hand or the wrist. Looked like he was ringing out the left hand. We'll take another look. Hmm. Yeah, 
You got to, with nobody on base, you've got to hide that throwing hand. You got to get it out of the way. Put it behind you, put it behind your mitt. Seems like there are catchers, though, that are going away from that. Yeah, I, I just don't know the reason why. You got to, you got to, that's, that's your, uh, that's your livelihood, that throwing arm. And you can see he almost rests that right hand on the right thigh as he sets up the mitt. Actually, I think that went off his left hand. Might not have gone I off do his too. left wrist. Yeah, I think he's still, yep. He's looking at that left wrist, but, but he either is. way, you gotta right. you gotta hide the right hand. One ball, two strike count on Stephen Williams. I saw Williams at the Tournament of Stars with the USA Baseball in Cary, North Carolina when he was in high school and was, as you said, touted as a highly regarded catcher and has been mostly in right field in his one-plus seasons. Hits this one deep to right field. Rivers will take a look, and this one is foul. The wind blowing across, Rusty, from left to right, and that one might have helped out the pitcher, Vaniciano, just a bit. Well, obviously, the left-hander has power to the pool side, and it was just a, it, was, it wasn't any doubt if it was long enough. It was just if it was going to be straight enough. Wind pushed it just to the right of that foul pole. I expect this ball to be away. Yep. Back-to-back strikeouts here in the second for Veneziano, his third in a row and fourth of the game. Well, set up for that breaking ball after pulling that home run ball foul. It's a good wipeout pitch there by Veneziano. Two out spaces empty. Kaysen Howell, the number nine hitter at the plate. Howell eight doubles on the year. And you and I both, I think I've seen Auburn a couple of times this year on television, seen some of Williams' at-bats. But that might right there have been somewhat indicative of an at-bat. Hit the ball hard, hit it foul, and then come back and strike out. But either way, I think he's got to get it in his mind, not that he struck out, but that he hit a ball hard. And I think that's what you have to concentrate on. McKee in the shortstop near the bag at second side. Retired one, two, three, second for Veneziano. Two nothing, Auburn. That play in left field by Marks is one that's not going to show up in the book. That if they can get it out right here, that just won Coastal Carolina a national title. The winning run is at second. Three two coming to Ryan Hogg. championship. Great images from 2016. Gary Gilmore and the Coastal Carolina Chanticleers winning it all in Omaha. Coastal down 2-0 here in the third. Corey Wood starts things off. Grounded out. Saw 12 pitches to open up the game in the first inning against Jack Owen. Ended up grounding out, but grinded out the at-bat. Check swing. Fair inside the bag at third and down the line. Wood turns first, heading for second. Ward up with the baseball, bobbled it. Wide turn around second by Wood, and he'll hold there. Boy, that is classic baseball by Coastal Carolina right there. A little excuse me, check swing. And I'll tell you, Steve, some, sometimes it's not how hard you hit it, it's where you hit it. And that ball hugged the line. Definitely a fair ball right down the line. Corey Wood, this is the second time through the lineup against Jake Owen. He has thrown over 50 pitches through the through the first time in the lineup, so they're getting a second look, so let's see how Coastal adjusts to the left-hander right here. Gaze, baseball, the game of inches. Yeah, or in that case, a game of an inch. Williams, distance, had the home run distance. In the bottom of the second, for Auburn, check swing by Wood at second with a leadoff double. Big swing by Rivers. He comes up empty. Struck out in his first at bat. Andrew Beckwith was the College World Series most outstanding player back in 2016. Had three wins. Gave up just two earned runs over 23 plus innings and struck out 14. It's 
just a great college baseball story. I mean, it's just incredible what Coastal did. Last year, the Chanticleers hosted in Conway. Beat LIU Brooklyn, then lost to Washington, then lost to UConn. Washington ended up going all the way to Omaha last year. It was their first ever trip. Washington and Texas, two of the eight teams last year in Omaha, failed to make the field this year. The other six representing their schools in 2019. I tell you, if anybody needs some quick outs, it's Jack Owen. 55 pitches at the rate he's going now, he's not going to make it out of the fourth. And Auburn's pretty thin in the pen, so getting him deep in the ball game would be extremely important for Auburn. Rivers again taking a big cut. Down in the count, nothing and two. 12 runs batted in in the Sun Belt Tournament last week go with the nine hits and another RBI chance right now, even though he's down 0-2 in the count. 31 extra base hits on the year for Keaton Rivers, who was a member of that 2016 National Championship team. Towards shortstop, Holland tossed a first, picked out of the dirt by Rankin Woley on the play. Wood crosses over to third base. Now, that's something you never used to see. Ball hit to the left side like that. The runner's yep. not going to try to move up. Nowadays, he did get a pretty good read as we take another look. That, that's a great point, Steve. And typically, as a base runner right there, when you're the at second base and get your secondary lead, if the ball is hit at or in front of you, you don't go. But what Wood did is he read that it was a, a slow chopper, and he was able not only to take third base, but he kind of ran in front of Will Holland, so he lost sight of that baseball for just a second. So very aggressive base running right there by Wood getting to third base with less than two outs. Jake Wright, one for one with a single. Had a two-out base hit back in the first and was left stranded. Jack Owen working with a runner at third and a 2 nothing lead. Pitch misses inside, and now Matt Scheffler, the catcher, is going to pay a visit. Auburn in the home whites, Coastal. White pants. Blue tops. Conversation continues. Gary Gilmore was talking with our producer, Thomas Morrissey, yesterday. Thomas is familiar with the Myrtle Beach, Conway, South Carolina area. Gary kind of describing what it's like for him Got 40 minutes or so on the drive to or from work, and most of the time, he said, music is off. He's just by himself with his thoughts. You need that this time of year. And that 40-minute drive is worth it when you're the head coach of a team that won the national championship three years ago. But more importantly, maybe, from a life standpoint, he lives on the intercoastal waterway, so you know, that can't be too bad either. <laughs> well, Scheffler went out to the mound, and Owen has fired two straight strikes. Forget a 40-minute drive. I tried to turn that into about 20, 25. <laughs> Get home as fast as possible. Exactly. Owen from the stretch, runner at third. What a leadoff double. Misses up and away. So here's the thing right here at three and two. You you can't you can't pitch around him with first base open because you got the four hole hitter in Beerman on deck that leads the team in home runs. Pass the first base dugout, back out onto the playing field. Four time in this ball game that Jack Owen has gone full on a batter. Rusty touched on it. His number is now over 60 in pitch count. Walked him, and that puts runners at first and third. And 
And that will bring Zach Bierman to the plate. Wood, excuse me, check swing, double down the third base side to open up the inning. Crossed a third on a ground down to the left side. Bierman mentioned the home runs. Five straight batters in the coastal lineup with 10 or more. They have four different players in the lineup. Bierman leads the way with 76 RBIs, but four batters with 50-plus runs batted in. We saw that 17 home run total for the season. Seven of those have come in the last 10 games. It's driven at 24 runs. That also included the last series against Appalachian State when he drove in 12 runs on eight hits. We have a visit to the mound, 2-0 Auburn leading. The ESPN Networks will bring you every game on the road to Omaha, starting with regional coverage on ESPN2, ESPNU, the SEC Network, and ESPN3. Whip around coverage also available through ESPN3 and the Bases Loaded Channel. All coverage is available on the ESPN app. Matt Schick, Mike Rooney on Bases Loaded. Conference on the mound right now. Steve Smith, the uh, pitching coach for Auburn in his second year, spent 21 years as the head coach at Baylor. 744 wins, the winningest coach in Baylor athletics. 13 regionals, four supers, College World Series in 2005. Head coach of the USA national team also in 2005. So Butch Thompson thinks it's very valuable. Now you got a you got basically you got two head coaches on the team. And he's in that volunteer role yeah, with exactly. Auburn. That's going to be a topic of conversation, not only during regionals around the country this weekend, but during Supers and even in Omaha. The paid assistants or the volunteers who aren't paid on staffs around the country. And Butch Thompson, you mentioned Steve Smith with Beerman at the plate, two on and one down. You know, I don't want to get too personal about this. Yep. we got a game going on, but let me just say this. Our sport is shorthanded. We only have 11.7 scholarships. The popularity is immense. And we only have three paid coaches. I mean, come on. Let's go. It's ridiculous. The coach-to-athlete ratio in baseball is different than every other collegiate sport. Beerman comes up empty. Actually, foul tipped it into the glove of the catcher, Scheffler. Uh, Wood at third, right the runner at first. If you're Beerman right here, Steve, you've got to expand. You've got to use the entire field. A home run would be great. A base hit is what Coastal needs. Owen picks up the strikeout. He was in need of an out in any way. Two outs in the inning. That's a big, big bat to strike out right there. And you see what Owen does. The fastball, and he climbs the ladder. That's a tough ball to lay off for any hitter. And you see more and more pitchers nowadays elevate to get that swing and miss third strike. It's hard to get on top of that baseball. Now it's up to Kyle Skeels, one for one with a leadoff base hit. And the second, he was stranded at third base. Coastal has stranded three over the first two innings and now two on with two down. Through the catcher all the way to the backstop. Here comes Wood. He'll score standing up. And Coastal Carolina on the board. Well, let's go back a couple of batters ago when Corey Wood took that extra 90 feet on that ground ball to Holland off the bat of Rivers. That's where that aggressive base running comes into play, gets Coastal's first run of the game. Auburn up 2-1, tying run at second with two away. That is right. Also moved up on the wild pitch. Bouncing ball towards third. Julian looks at the runner. Fires across the diamond in time. Side retired. One run for Coastal Carolina. We'll go to the bottom of the third. Auburn two, Coastal one. Welcome back to the NCAA Baseball Regionals presented by Capital One. A look at our bracket here in Atlanta. 
Georgia Tech, Florida A&M, 7 Eastern on ESPN app, ESPN3, E3. This is the first of six and possibly seven with a game seven if necessary on Monday. The winner here will advance to the winner's bracket for a game Saturday. The loser's bracket will see an elimination on Saturday. Then we'll have an elimination on Sunday as well with game one. Nice crowd for game one. They have already called it a sellout for tonight for Florida A&M and Georgia Tech, the number three national seed. Chopper off the bat of Judd Ward towards second base. Corey Wood takes care of it. And a quick out for Anthony Boniziano here in the third inning. Boniziano has now retired five straight hitters. We'll go back to the volunteer coaching assistant, and I like how you put it. And I think the biggest thing right now for the future of that fourth assistant being paid on a college baseball coaching staff is conversation. Dialogue has to continue. It can't be put in the closet and not talked about. Coaches need to talk about it. And even the volunteer assistants, to a certain degree, the guys that it affects should be part of the conversation as well. Yeah, because I agree. I agree. those guys are working the same amount of hours. It's not, it's not as if it's a volunteer position and you work on internship where you're working 20 to 30 hours. You're working a full-time job. Sometimes you're the first to the field and the last one to leave, especially if guys want to work on hitting or pitching, depending on what the specialty is for that volunteer coach. Ryan Bliss, one for one with a run scored. Auburn, it's two runs in the first inning. Judd Ward retired quickly by Veneziano. And what you want to see here from the coastal left-hander, your team got you a run. You're down a run, and right now you want a quick e quick inning and at the very least put a zero up there. Up and away to Ryan Bliss, freshman all-SEC team. Has started every game this year for Butch Thompson and the Tigers. 30th round pick out of high school last year. Rated the second best shortstop in the state of Georgia. Taken by the Red Sox. Sharply hit. McKeon on to first base. Two ground ball outs and two away. You know, this is kind of a, a good spot for Auburn as far as getting assigned to the Atlanta Regional. Auburn recruits the Atlanta area in the state of Georgia pretty hard. In fact, they have eight players on the roster from the state of Georgia. Auburn to Atlanta, just over 100 miles. Butch Thompson said yesterday, asked him about the drive over on the bus, said, great, just slowed things up as we got to Atlanta, as expected. <laughs> I know that feeling. Connor Davis, a strikeout victim in his first at bat, six straight retired by Veneziano. Big cut, came up empty. Veneziano looking for his second straight 1-2-3 inning. Again, Davis with a big cut. Elevating that fastball at 1-1 to get the swing and miss. That's what he got him out last time with a two-strike pitch. I'd go to it again. What's the adjustment you make as a hitter here if you're I'm, Davis? I mean, you've got to you got to drive that front shoulder. You got to use the back side of the field. Out on strikes, seven in a row retired by Anthony Veneziano, and he has struck out five. Two one Tigers here in Atlanta. I was number one pick. It was um, honestly breathtaking, and it was awesome. I was surrounded by family and friends and teammates and coaches and staff and just people that I was around every day and um, I wanted them to be a part of it and, and we all were so you know when that moment happened uh, it, it was pretty special not only for me but for those people as well. That's a pretty good picture right there in Casey Mize. 
you know, the great story about Mize is he wasn't drafted out of high school. So you talk about that man right there developing a player into the number one pick. Look at the second pick last year was from Georgia Tech, Joey Bart. So first two picks in the draft, both of those teams are playing in this Atlanta Regional this year. And in talking with Butch Thompson yesterday, he shared with us he's got guys in the bullpen, and you said earlier, they're thin. Ball rocketed in the air to right center field by Shavers. Going back at the wall, jumping, and this one is gone. Hal was right at the wall, jump, but could not catch up with it. Shavers the leadoff home run, and we are tied at two. That has to feel extra special as far as a great feeling. You can see the emotion and the excitement from Parker Shavers. As I mentioned, when he batted earlier in the game, he is a sophomore from Montgomery. Wanted to go to Auburn, but the offer never came. Got it up and just out of the reach of Cason Howell in center field. Look at this celebration right here. Little squibber up the first base side. Rankin Woolley takes care of it. McKean retired, one away. Casey Mize last year in 2018 in the June draft. First top ten pick for Auburn baseball since Frank Thomas was selected seventh overall by the White Sox in 1989. That worked out pretty well. It did en route to a Hall of Fame career. Mize just got moved up to double-A several weeks ago. And and did you see what he did in his first double-A start? Yeah, yeah, go ahead and tell us. A no-hitter. With Double A Erie in the Tigers organization. So on that staff, there's Logan Shore, former Florida pitcher, Alex Fayeto, former Florida pitcher. So you could have three SEC guys for the Tigers in the next year or two in the rotation in Detroit. Detroit really, really likes to draft college players, ACC and SEC players. Foul ball at home plate. Mike Kone go for one. Butch Thompson was saying about Casey Mize, the arms that he has now, they're going to develop. But right now it's about winning, and you develop over the course of the season. And some of his young arms, you know, he's expecting big things from the future. And he said a lot of the pitchers right now, Casey Mize, you mentioned, not drafted out of high school when he was a freshman at Auburn. It took time. He built that foundation. Tanner Burns on the other side last year as a freshman was outstanding trying to build that on that in his sophomore year. Yeah, and I think, too, with the kind of schedule Auburn has played this year, a lot of those young arms, you know, from a confidence standpoint, from a one-loss record, may not look all that great. And now, will that make them better probably next year and in 2021? Probably, because they're playing against really good competition. But right now, you know, sometimes the you know the confidence level can get down, and, and that's huge for a baseball player because – Especially from a hitting standpoint, if you're a young hitter struggling, you know, this is a this our sport is a game of failure. If you fail seven out of ten times, you're in the starting lineup. And so it's how you handle failure more so than, than a success makes you a really good player in my opinion. After giving up the home run, Owen has gotten the next two hitters in the lineup. Cameron Piercy 0 for 1, number nine hitter for Coastal, where Knotted up at two here in the fourth inning. Auburn, two in the first inning. Coastal a run in the third, tying it up here in the fourth. On the leadoff home run off the bat of Parker Shavers. There's a base hit served in the left field out of the reach of Holland. And Piercy keeps the inning alive. Take a look at some of the numbers and the round to go. If you're a high school baseball player, you're drafted out of high school, and Tanner Burns was elected to go the college round to a four-year school. Opening day rosters, SEC, ACC, Pac-12, they're the numbers. And well over 50% of players that are drafted that were on big league rosters this year went to four-year programs. Well, and I think, too, because our sport has gotten so much better and so much more popular, you know, signing out of high school – you know, sounds great when you're an 18-year-old, but the the bus rides in rookie ball in single A, it, it's it's demanding. It's not glamorous, and 
if you go play some big-time college baseball, that certainly cuts down on your time in the minors. They take the baseball from Jack Owen. We have a pitching change. Elliot Anderson will take the hill for Auburn when we come back. Jack Owen's day has come to an end. Owen, the starter for Auburn, four strikeouts over the course of his three and two third innings, giving up a run in the third and one more here in the fourth on the home run by Shavers. Owen responsible for the runner on base, so the book is still open on the sophomore. And Owen gives way to another lefty, and the new pitcher in the ballgame for the Tigers is Elliot Anderson. Anderson with five wins on the season. That's tops. On this Auburn club, 56 and a third innings pitched. He has punched out 59 batters, walked 25. Opponents hit 262 off the 6'3 junior. Last time out, he had a start against Tennessee in the SEC tournament. He enters with a runner at first base and two down in the inning for Coastal Carolina. Down 2 nothing and tying the game up here in the fourth inning. Now 88 home runs on the season for Coastal Carolina. I think one of the reasons that Butch Thompson and Steve Smith decided to make a pitching change right there, yeah, the pitch count was up a little bit, sure. But this is now, believe it or not, the third time through the lineup already, and we're just in the top of the fourth for Coastal. So I think giving them a different look is probably something that – I think the Auburn staff probably thinks that they need right now against this powerful coastal hitting team. Corey Wood, one for two. Lead off double on the third inning. Will look like a line drive double on tomorrow's box score, right? Yep. Check swing, roller up the third base side that went down the left field line. He ended up scoring on a wild pitch. My partner, Rusty Enzer, played at Tennessee 1981-1982. Hit 330 over his two seasons with the Volunteers. Were you aware of a starting pitcher and seeing him for a second and third time and understanding that the success or the possibility of success was more in your favor as a hitter? You know, man, I hate to say this, but, you know, it really was different back then. We didn't see velo of, you know, 92 to 95 and things like that. We didn't see a lot of change-ups, at least I didn't. It was basically fastball, breaking ball, and from my standpoint – I was just trying to put the ball in play. I didn't really care if it was a lefty or a righty. And, the, you know, the second time through in the lineup, you know, back in, in the SEC play back when I played, we played the teams in your division twice in a, in a home-and-home three-game series. So you were familiar with what they had. It That's how like, you yeah. put your book together on an yeah. opposing pitcher by seeing them. Well, we didn't have a book back then. Per se. <laughs> yeah, but yes. in my mind, right. I had – listen, if you're you're going to see the same three starters when, when we play Florida, whether it's home or away, it, it's going to be the same. So, yeah, you remember what they thrown for sure the previous time. And also today with so many games available. Yeah, I mean, it's – The video that's available, what, did you – you were on TV maybe, what, two or three times? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because of the ESPN app, I mean, there's tons of, of scouting that you can do, both as a hitter and a pitcher and a coach, as far as positioning. You see more shifts in college now because of that. Inside, it hit him. And Wood is a two-out base runner. That will move Piercy up to second base. Yeah, it's just such an advantage for the college coaching and, and the college game today. Sixth time this year that Wood has been hit by a pitch. 94th time overall for Coastal hitters. And Keaton Rivers 0 for 2 stands in. More and more you talk to today's college coaches, they are taking the information in. They're using it to their advantage as often as possible. Two out base hit here could provide Coastal with its first lead of the ball game. A home run by Shavers, a leadoff hitter against a starter, Jack Owen, who goes three and two-third innings. Owen is responsible for the runner at second base. Opposite way foul. We see it again. Piercy at second is getting off to a great secondary lead, and 
Both middle infielders are playing back here. And we saw Jack Owen earlier either step off or wheel around towards second base, trying to just keep that runner close. And in this situation, it's a base hit to the outfield. You're trying to give your outfielders a chance to cut down that runner. Yeah, with, with that aggressive secondary lead you're talking about, you got no chance. But it, it's hard because, you know, Holland's playing over in the hole, at the shortstop, because of, you know, Keaton Rivers is pretty much a, a pool-happy type hitter. So that's why he's playing in, in, so far in the hole on the left side. Bliss more up the middle, but he's playing deep. Breaking ball strike. One two count on Rivers. Right awaits on deck. Postal hitless so far today in five at bats with runners in scoring position. Anderson trying to strand a pair. Now he wheels around. Again, Piercy was sort of going back and forth, dancing away. He'll get off even further here. Two strike pitch, and we'll do it again. Pretty good location on that slider going with the back foot at one and two trying to get Rivers to swing over the top of it. Anderson does have a really nice two-seam fastball. It's got a, got a lot of run and tail to it. Showed it earlier in the count. That might be something to come back to, change the eye level and the location with two strikes. See how much you could save on renter's insurance. Jack Owens' day has come to an end. Oh, and the starter for Auburn, four strikeouts over the course of his three and two-third innings. Giving up a run in the third and one more here in the fourth on the home run by Shavers. Owen responsible for the runner on base, so the book is still open on the sophomore. And Owen gives way to another lefty, and the new pitcher in the ballgame for the Tigers is Elliot Anderson. Anderson with five wins on the season. That's tops. On this Auburn club, 56 and a third innings pitched. He has punched out 59 batters, walked 25. Opponents hit 262 off the 6'3 junior. Last time out, he had a start against Tennessee in the SEC tournament. He enters with a runner at first base and two down in the inning for Coastal Carolina. Down 2 nothing and tying the game up here in the fourth inning. Now 88 home runs on the season for Coastal Carolina. I think one of the reasons that Butch Thompson and Steve Smith decided to make a pitching change right there, yeah, the pitch count was up a little bit, sure. But this is now, believe it or not, the third time through the lineup already, and we're just in the top of the fourth for Coastal. So I think giving them a different look is probably something that uh, – I think the Auburn staff probably thinks that they need right now against this powerful coastal hitting team. Corey Wood, one for two. Leadoff double on the third inning. Will look like a line drive double on tomorrow's box score, right? Yeah. Check swing, roller up the third base side that went down the left field line. He ended up scoring on a wild pitch. My partner, Rusty Enzer, played at Tennessee 1981-1982. Hit 330 over his two seasons with the Volunteers. Were you aware of a starting pitcher and seeing him for a second and third time and understanding that the success or the possibility of success was more in your favor as a hitter? You know, man, I hate to say this, but, it, you know, it really was different back then. We didn't see velo of, you know, 92 to 95 and things like that. It, we didn't see a lot of change-ups. At least I didn't. It was basically fastball, breaking ball, and from my standpoint – I was just trying to put the ball in play. I didn't really care if it was a lefty or a righty. And, the, you know, the second time through the lineup, you know, back in, in the SEC play back when I played, we played the teams in your division twice in a home-and-home home three-game series. So you were familiar with what they had. It That's how like, you yeah. put your book together on an yeah. opposing pitcher by seeing them. 
Well, we didn't have a book back then. Per se. <laughs> yeah, but yes. in my mind, right. I had – listen, if you're you're going to see the same three starters when, when we play Florida, whether it's home or away, it, it's going to be the same. So, yeah, you remember what they thrown for sure the previous time. And also today with so many games available. Yeah, I mean, it's – The video that's available – you were on TV maybe, what, two or three times? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because of the ESPN app, I mean, there's tons of, of scouting that you can do, both as a hitter and a pitcher and a coach, as far as positioning. You see more shifts in college now because of that. Inside it hit him. And Wood is a two-out base runner. That will move Piercy up to second base. You know, it's just such an advantage for the college coaching and, and the college game today. Sixth time this year that Wood has been hit by a pitch. 94th time overall for Coastal hitters. And Keaton Rivers 0 for 2 stands in. More and more you talk to today's college coaches, they are taking the information in. They're using it to their advantage as often as possible. Two out base hit here could provide Coastal with its first lead of the ball game. A home run by Shavers, a leadoff hitter against a starter, Jack Owen, who goes three and two-third innings. Owen is responsible for the runner at second base. Opposite way foul. We see it again. Piercy at second is getting off to a great secondary lead, and both middle infielders are playing back here. And we saw Jack Owen earlier either step off or wheel around towards second base, trying to just keep that runner close. And in this situation, it's a base hit to the outfield. You're trying to give your outfielders a chance to cut down that runner. Yeah, with, with that aggressive secondary lead you're talking about, you got no chance. But it's hard because, you know, Holland's playing over in the hole, the shortstop, because of, you know, Keaton Rivers is pretty much a a pull-happy type hitter. So that's why he's playing so far in the hole on the left side. Bliss more up the middle, but he's playing deep. Breaking ball strike. One-two count. On Rivers, right awaits on deck. Coastal, hitless so far today, and five at-bats with runners in scoring position. Anderson trying to strand a pair. Now he wheels around. Again, Piercy was sort of going back and forth, dancing away. He'll get off even further here. Two strike pitch, and we'll do it again. Pretty good location on that slider going with the back foot at one and two, trying to get Rivers to swing over the top of it. Anderson does have a really nice two-seam fastball. It's got got a lot of run and tail to it. Showed it earlier in the count. That might be something to come back to, change the eye level and the location with two strikes. Picks up the strikeout. Rivers out. A run across for Coastal, 2-2 ball game. We'll talk with Gary Gilmore, the head coach of the Chanticleers, when we come back. Coastal Carolina head coach Gary Gilmore joins us from the Chanticleers dugout 2-2 ball game. And coach Anthony Veneziano gave up the two in the first inning, but he starts the inning off here having retired seven in a row. How has he settled in from your vantage point? Uh, he's just throwing strikes and mixing his pitches very well. And, uh, you know, it's all about getting ahead of hitters and uh, making pitches. Coach, you guys had, from an offensive standpoint, had such a monstrous Sun Belt tournament. How do you keep the momentum going after four or five days off? 
I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's as much about focus and concentration. I mean, again, you're not gonna, you know, we, you're not gonna score, you know, 12 runs a game against, uh, you know, top-notch people in the first game of a regional. They got rested bullpens and, and rested starters. So I mean, you know, we're, we're gonna have to grind this one out. Coach, thanks so much. Thank you. Gary Gilmore joining us from the Coastal Dugout, 24th season as the head coach of the Chanticleers, 30th year overall coaching in the college ranks, over 1,200 wins. Will Holland, number four hitter in the Auburn lineup, starting things off here in the home fourth inning. 2-2 ball game, two seed versus number three seed in the Atlanta Regional. Number three national seed and host Georgia Tech will take on Florida A&M at 7 Eastern on the ESPN app. Leadoff walk to Holland. That's not what you wanted to do if you're Veneziano. I'm That's glad his we got, first walk of the ball game. I'm glad we got Coach Gilmore off before that happened for sure. <laughs> you, know, you mentioned Gilmore's over 1,200 wins, 1,215 to be exact. That ranks him 25, or should, should, excuse me, 25th all time as far as wins in Division I college baseball. Of course, Mike Martin leading the way with over 2,000. Last check, Florida State was leading 6-0 over Florida Atlantic in the Athens Regional. John McCormick and the Florida Atlantic Owls took Florida to a seventh game in the Gainesville Regional last year. And in is the number two seed, Florida State, in for the 42nd straight year, 40th straight year, under 11, Mike Martin. His 40th and final year as the head coach of the Seminoles. Toss over to first base. Holland does have 14 stolen bases on the year. And Gary Gilmore, you mentioned in the top 25, he and Danny Haller might end up, well, I think Danny's got a couple more wins, yeah. but they could be jockeying at some point. Scheffler, RBI base hit in the first inning. Facing Veneziano for a second time. Kyle Peterson, when Mike Martin was approaching 2,000 wins, just kind of put it in a perspective of, you know, a good season, a great season, you've won 40 games. Now multiply that times 10 years, that's 400 wins. So you take a Gary Gilmore or Danny Hall at Georgia Tech, that puts you around 1,600 or over 1,600. This one's skied in the air, right center field. Rivers, the right fielder, takes care of it. Athens bracket, Florida State, Florida Atlantic. It's now a 6-3 ball game. Don't count out the Owls, Georgia and Mercer. Georgia, the number four national seed. UCLA, Vanderbilt, Georgia Tech, Georgia, the top four national seeds. The seedings came down on Sunday. Field of 64 was announced. Earlier this week on Memorial Day, one out, and here's Edouard Julian, strikeout victim against Veneciano in his first at bat. You know, Julian's a great story. We talked about him being from Quebec. You're going like, how does a kid from Canada get to Auburn? Well, Butch Thompson several years ago when he was an assistant at Mississippi State has a good friend who coaches a lot of the Canadian uh, junior teams and so forth, and he recruited a kid by the name of Jacob Robson at Mississippi State. Robson in AAA with the Tigers right now. And so he called Butch Thompson. He said, hey, did you like Robson? He said, sure. And he goes, well, I got a guy that you may like a lot better than Jacob Robson. So they came down for a visit, and that's how Edouard Julian ends up on the plains and speaks three languages, and at first – he, did, he had trouble kind of uh, understanding his uh, professors in class, and he came to Butch Thompson and said, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really sure I understand everything that's going on in his first semester, and Butch Thompson says, well, that's a problem. We need to correct that. <laughs> so uh, you talk about recruiting not only nationwide, but also got to go to a different country to get the right players sometimes. Julian with a base hit, setting up first and second for the Tigers with one down. Frank and Wolio for one, strikeout victim to start things off in the second. 
And that was a great piece of hitting by Julian, using the entire field, going with the pitch, a tough left-on-left matchup, did exactly right, keeping that front shoulder closed, driving that ball to left field. That's the kind of an A-B that can really get you going. Runners take off, ground ball, base hit through the left side. Holland will come in to score. Julian is going to go to third. Rankin Wally delivers the RBI single. Tigers back out in front and up 3-2. to two. I like Butch Thompson and third baseman Gabe Gross, who controls the offense, putting the runners in motion. I think Auburn has to do some things maybe a little bit differently. I don't think they have the offensive punch to go base to base and try to outscore a team like Coastal Carolina, which can put up a crooked number at any time in the, up and down the lineup. So you put the runners in motion. Not only do you score a run, but you got a guy like Julian who has good speed because he was going on the pitch and the base hit to left field. He gets the third base. So now he's 90 feet away, just one out in the inning. Veneziano started the inning, having retired seven in a row and nine of the previous 11 batters that he faced. A walk and two base hits. Towering fly ball, deep right field. Williams has gone yard. This is what Auburn's been waiting for all year. The threat of the three-run homer, and it happens in regional play here in Atlanta for Stephen Williams. We've talked all game long, Steve, about the powerful bats of Coastal, and they've hit one in the game. But the three-run home run by Stephen Williams. Now, he hit one foul in his first at bat, ended up striking out. That fastball was right there, belt high, looking to get that extension. That's no doubt. You talk about literally hitting one into the trees. That's it right there. His seventh home run on the season, four runs across. This one line to center field. Shavers going back, reaches up on the run and makes the catch. Hal put a charge into that one and retired for out number two. This is the kind of inning that Coastal has grown accustomed to. Yeah, that's exactly right. But, you know, again, and we and we talked about it, Auburn ranked just 11th in the SEC in batting average, 192nd in the nation coming into this regional. And once you get to postseason play, everything is flushed, everything's clean. You got a new – you have a new set of thoughts – sometimes a new attitude, and, you know, it doesn't take a lot. You know, hitting's contagious, and a big three-run bomb like that by Williams, you never know what can happen to a team. Judd Ward, one for two, single run scored, 6-2, Auburn. Coastal tied it up in the top of the inning on a home run by Parker Shavers, four across for the Tigers. Soft liner over the shortstop, McKeon. Ward aboard with a two-out base hit, his second single of the ball game. It's a great piece of hitting by Judd Ward. Fighting off just enough. Keep the inning alive. Looks like we're going to get a little visit from Drew Thomas, pitching coach. 13th year at Coastal with Gary Gilmore. And he has kept his staff intact, and I think that bodes well for programs. Huge. You know, Butch Thompson, after two years, did make some changes. Steve Smith came on. Gabe Gross came on. Carl Nunmaker came on. And that was something similar, Gary Gilmore and Butch Thompson yesterday. Coming into the regional, understanding, hey, our season could be under uh, over Saturday, it could be over Sunday, it could be over Monday, it could be over Tuesday. They're already starting to look ahead. They're in the moment, but they're looking ahead to next year, and both coaches, to their credit, admitted to us, you know what, there might be things that we need to tinker with. I might have to change my mindset 
Butch is young, uh, young in his coaching career, fourth year here at Auburn, but of course has great experience as an assistant coach with several different programs. Gary Gilmore, 30 years, still wanting to get better, still understanding there's a path to get better in some way. And I thought that I walked away from that very impressed yesterday. Ryan Briss, one for two. He singled in the first, grounded to short, and his last at bat in the third inning. He's the eighth batter to come to the plate in this inning. And it all started with a leadoff walk. First and only walk so far allowed by Veneziano. Auburn has already gone to the bullpen. Starter Jake, uh, Jack Owen, three and two-thirds and two runs allowed. Good hit and run count right here. Three and nothing on Bliss. Connor Davis. Stands on deck, hoping for an opportunity with two down. Plus taking all the way, it's three and one. Coastal is not led, they have stranded six. Ball four, two batters, uh, two runners on now with two down. It's it, it started with the walk, and I think it the complexion of the inning changed with that double steal. Take a look at the Tigers. That includes the games they played at Hoover. So you had three games to finish out the SEC slate at LSU. The three in the SEC tournament. There are people around the nation who will certainly take notice of Auburn hitters coming alive in game one here in Atlanta. Julian, you mentioned it, on his base at the left field, stayed in on the ball. Yeah. Williams the home run. I mean, a lot of good things have happened for Auburn. You know, the, the walk, the double steal. The, the A-B by Julian going to the opposite field, you know, that just sets up everything. And then, you know, you know Woolley with the RBI single and, of course, Williams with the tree shot. Davis has struck out in his first two at-bats. The one other box to check would come on Saturday with Tanner Burns making the start in a potential winner's bracket matchup against either Georgia Tech or Florida A&M. Now, now, granted, we have a long way to go in this game. It's far from over. But with Jack Owen going out of the game so early for Auburn, you know, they've got Elliot Anderson on the bump, and he's kind of a hybrid guy. You know, he, he can bridge that gap. He can go multiple innings. So he's a guy that can get you to the eighth or the ninth. And, and so that, that would be important from Auburn from a pitching standpoint. But, again, a lot of baseball left, and you got to battle a lot of powerful bats from from Coastal. Four-run lead right now for the Tigers. Connor Davis up there with two down and four runs across. It's like the changeup right there. Well, he's had, it again. he's had the success up in the zone with a fastball away. Now, featuring that changeup, you'd go again? Yeah, I'd go to the changeup again. Like you said, he's gotten him twice on the elevated fastball. I'd go back-to-back changeups, blown away. I tried to elevate. Three ball, two strike count, two outs, two on, and four across for Auburn.
ball in the gap, could score two right here. A pop-up, right center field. Coming over as the right fielder, Rivers makes the catch. Auburn dents a scoreboard for four runs. It was Stephen Williams putting the charge into one. And that was the big blow, a three-run home run, and Auburn is up by four at the end of four. Welcome back to the NCAA Baseball Regionals presented by Capital One. Steve Lennox, Rusty Enzer from Atlanta. News and notes from around the country. The 16 regionals underway today and tonight. UCLA, the number one national seed. Boy, you're the number one national seed. That's tough going. Miami in 1999 when the format changed, the only number one national seed to win in Omaha. Ten teams for the third time out of the SEC making the tournament field. And Florida State was one of the last four in when the field of 64 was announced on Monday. My partner, Rusty Enzer, former Tennessee volunteer in the early 1980s. This one's skied in the air to right field. And Williams, right near the warning track, makes the catch. Right is retired. And there's one down. Reminder, the ESPN Networks bring you every game on the road to Omaha, starting with regional coverage on ESPN2, ESPNU, the SEC Network, and ESPN3. Whip around coverage is also available through ESPN3 and the Bases Loaded channel. All coverage is available on the ESPN app. One out, base is empty. Zach Bierman stands in for the third time. And for the first time against Elliott Anderson, struck out in each of his two at-bats against Owen, the starter. 6-2 ball game. Fifth inning. Winner advances to the winner's bracket on Saturday. And the loser will face their first elimination game here in Atlanta. Over the years, and this is now your 13th time covering a regional? Yes. Why, what makes, what's something that's overlooked when it comes to getting that all-important win on day one? I mean, you know, I think the obvious answer is it keeps your your, your pitching staff. Uh, you know, you, you potentially don't have to come out of the loser's bracket, so it saves on arms. And, you know, I think once you get to Sunday, you know, as many arms as you have available, I think enhances your chances to, to win a regional. And especially with, with the competition level being so much more now than it was maybe 15, 20 years ago, it's just – you know, any team can beat anybody. I mean, we've seen four seeds win national championships, for crying out loud. Davidson two years ago in the tournament for the first time won the Chapel Hill Regional. And we had, of course, Fresno State winning the national championship as a four seed in 2008. And Stony Brook getting to the College World Series. Kent State. There's a tie-in there with Danny Hall. We'll touch on that during the course of the weekend with Kent State and Georgia coach Scott Strickland. Towards first base and foul. SEC with 10 teams in the tournament field for the third time. They did it in 2014, last year in 2018, and again here in 2019. ACC has eight teams this year. They had 10 back in 2016. And then... We saw in the graphic a few moments ago, Florida State was one of the last four in when the field was announced on Monday. You know, I know everybody's looking at numbers, and strength of schedule, and RPI, and wins, and quality wins, but, I mean, it's it, from, a, from a hard standpoint, it would be hard to keep that man out of the NCAA tournament in his last year. And with Florida and even Florida State, and this is the first year since 2006 that the state of Florida is not hosting a regional. Does reputation, does history, track record, storyline play into that, do you think, over the weekend? You know, again, we've got computers, we've got RPI, we've, we've got all that stuff, but the human element at some point, comes into play, I think. Florida State Seminoles, 42 straight appearances. Beerman out on strikes for the third time in this ballgame, two down. Well, 
sometimes after you amass 90 hits and score 80 runs and hit 18 home runs in a conference tournament, and you take four or five days off, you know, that was a question I had for Gary Gilmore. You know, sometimes, you know, baseball is a sport that's geared to be played every day. And that's a long week off after a conference tournament and once a regional, you know, comes to comes into play. A lot, you know, of course, they're, again, they're facing, as Gary Gilmore said, they're facing, facing better pitching potentially with, with Auburn and potentially Georgia Tech if they play each other. So that has a lot to do with it. But And baseball is a game of yeah. routine. This might sure. be the first time in a while where they didn't have that midweek game. They finished yeah. Sunday, traveled yesterday, worked out yesterday. All four teams worked out here in Atlanta on Thursday. But you didn't have that Tuesday or Wednesday game this week, so that knocks you off your routine just a bit. That's right. And, and some teams uh, in the midweek, you know, in the middle of the season, they'll play both Tuesday and Wednesday on you know with sandwiched weekend series. So it's – Woley makes the catch. Anderson a one, two, three, fifth. We've gone halfway. Auburn head coach Butch Thompson will join us from the dugout when we return. Auburn six, Coastal Carolina two, day one of the Atlanta Regional. Butch Thompson, head coach of the Auburn Tigers, joins us from the third base dugout. Coach, you talked with us yesterday about some of the hitters you want to get going. Julian had a great base hit opposite way in the fourth inning. Two batters later, Stephen Williams follows with a three-run shot. Great to see, and this is definitely what those guys have done in the past, and we've been waiting, so uh, uh, no time better than now. Looks like your game plan with Owen being a left-hander trying to down this coastal offense, and then you, you then you bridge it with uh, Anderson, kind of back to back lefties. So far, that's that's been a good game plan for you, hasn't it? Well, we'd like to get a little further with Jack, of course, but I give I tip my hat to Coastal and Coach Gilmore and those guys got 86 pitches there in three and two thirds. So they did a good job. Anderson has come behind these guys in the past, and uh, I, it's just an offensive setup with this wind blowing today in a small strike zone. So I think both offenses got to keep keep swinging. Coach Thompson, thank you very much. Thank you. Butch Thompson joining us from the Auburn dugout. Matt Erdinson is now on for Coastal Carolina. Anthony Veneziano is done after four innings, gives up the six runs. And Erdinson, now you see a right-hander for the first time. Is the lefty got the start for Coastal? Erdinson, six wins in 24 appearances now for Coastal. Their bullpen was so important in 2016, and we just talked with Butch Thompson, a 6-2 lead right now, and he told us as we were getting ready to go back on air, we need to add runs. You add runs here. What's big for Auburn right now, we talk about Tanner Burns possibly going into game two, and that could come in the winner's bracket, but their big reliever is Cody Greenhill, who can go three or four innings, but... If you don't have to use them on day one, that gives you so many more options on day two and even day three. Again, uh, pitching is the key when you get deep in, in a regional. And, you know, he's right. Six may not be enough. With the way Coastal can swing it and the threat, they've hit, what, 88 home runs now on the season. So, they, again, like I mentioned, they can put up a crooked number at any point in the game. And the seventh inning has been their most dominant inning as far as scoring runs, too. Second straight inning, Holland reaches with a leadoff walk. Up next, the catcher, Matt Scheffler. And Matt Scheffler, one out of two with an RBI base hit, back in the first for the Tigers. Auburn, two runs in the first inning against Veneziano. He settled in after that. Retired the side in order in the second, did the same in the third, but then ran into trouble with a leadoff walk in the fourth. Rankin Woley had an RBI base hit. Williams fouled with a three-run shot to right. First pitch strike. Erdinson would like to get his team back to the College World Series. He's from Omaha. University of Nebraska, Omaha. 
in the field of 64. First time ever for Omaha. Creighton is in. Yep. Nebraska is in. First time that that's happened. There's always great crowds in Omaha for the College World Series, but just imagine the storyline if they actually got an in-state team all the way there as one of the eight. Be a hard ticket. Hard ticket anyway. Erdenson from the stretch. The runner goes. Ball bounced towards third base. Koenig, one play on to first. And that retires Scheffler. One down, runner at second base. This week, the Sunday night baseball crew is in New York for the series finale between the Red Sox and Yankees. Our coverage will begin at 6 p.m. Eastern on ESPN and the ESPN app with baseball tonight's Sunday night countdown. Red Sox-Yankees this weekend. NBA Finals got underway on Thursday night. That series will continue. Toronto up a game on ABC and ESPN Radio on Sunday, also available on the ESPN app. And the Raptors are up a game. All those people who said it was going to be a quick and short series have to rethink things with the Warriors going down in game one. Throw back to second base, and out at second is Holland. I think uh, McCann juggled that baseball. Yeah. And Matt, or rather, Brian DeBrower got help from Josh Schnepps, the third base umpire. Holland got up to plead his case, and we'll take another look. Well, he was definitely going on the play, and you see him leaning right there. See, he loses the handle of the baseball right there. Would have been an easy call for replay had it gone to that. Auburn pretty aggressive running the bases so far in this game today. Edouard Julian one for two with a single. 59 steals on the season for Auburn coming into the game today. They had three guys in, with double-digit steals. So they don't run a ton, but they've been putting guys in motion to – create holes in the defense, and their aggressiveness, I think, from an offensive standpoint, has been a factor in the reason they're winning 6-2. You know, sometimes it just takes something a little like that to, to jumpstart it. Because when you do put runners in motion, you put pressure on the defense, you create holes in the defense. So, you know, a number, you know, can drive in a run. Ardenson giving up the leadoff walk, working to Julian with one down. You know, base running is a, is a part of the game that doesn't get talked about a lot, and I know all the coaches preach it, all the coaches practice it. But it's such a, especially in close games, and especially in postseason regional play, it's such a huge factor. A balk is called on Erdenson. That's the second of the game. We had one earlier that was called on the starter, Anthony Veneziano. And Gary Gilmore wants an explanation from the home plate umpire, Jeff Hendricks. That's big right now because now you've got the runner at third, less than two outs. Quick explanation. I think he said he started you know, to the stretch and, and stopped, but, you know, it looked to me like he was kind of taking a deep breath, really. I didn't see a whole lot in that. One out, runner at third. Coastal Carolina brings the infield up. See, now that changes the complexion of the inning. So now you got Coastal playing in on the grass, so... Ball's got to go through on the ground. But Julian with a really good chance of uh, knocking one on the ground and finding the hole. 
And you talked about putting runners in motion, infielders moving around. That creates holes. And here, Julian. Changes, yeah, changes yeah. the complexion of the, of the at-bat with the balk. Full count, three and two. Rankin Woolley stands on deck for the Tigers. Up 6-2. They played the run here in this inning. Now you take it out where take it out of the equation where one swing can tie you up. Tacking on runs, really important, especially when you're playing against an offense like Coastal. Stays alive. Auburn Tigers, one of 10 SEC schools in the field of 64 here in 2019. Tiger fan base has traveled well to Atlanta for game one. Ball four and two walks in the inning issued by Matt Erdenson. Well, that's not the worst thing in the world for Erdenson with one out in the inning. Now he's a quality of pitch away from possibly getting a double play ball if he makes the right pitch and getting out of the inning. Plus, it lets your middle infield go back with the defensive alignment. Catch your skills out in front of home plate, first and, sir, uh, first and third situation. Now let's see how aggressive Auburn gets right here by possibly putting Julian in motion and creating maybe some first and third offense right here from the running game. And this is similar to what we had in the last inning, although in the last inning it was with one out and first and second, but Auburn put the runners in motion, Holland from second, Julian from first, and Woolley came through with a base hit. Breeze is picked up just a bit. Still continues blowing across from left to right field. Two walks in the inning. And Erdenson creating a mess all by himself. His first inning in relief. Veneciano gave up six Runs total on seven hits over four innings. Playing with fire right now, falling behind two and nothing. Now I know Erdenson, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, a couple of times about the hit and run. I'm not suggesting that Holland at third's going to take off, but this is a good hit and run count. Only problem is Erdenson's been a little erratic. Base hit right field. And to score is Holland. Julian on his way to third. He is held up by Gabe Gross. RBI base hit by Rankin Woolley. And the Tigers tack on another run. That's a really good A-B by the Auburn first baseman, Rankin Woolley. Liked the way, even though it was a 2-0 pitch, he wasn't trying to hit a three-run homer. Ball was on the outer third of the plate. Drove it to right field. Textbook hitting by Rankin Woolley. And now we'll have a visit to the mound by Drew Thomas. Two on with one down here in the inning. One run across, and Stephen Williams is going to be the batter for the Tigers. And this is what he did. As Thomas goes out to the mound to have a chat. Erdenson allowing three base runners so far in this inning. No activity in the bullpen right now for the Chanticleers. All four infielders in on the conversation. Now Jeff Hendricks is going to pay a visit. So Williams will stand in, and this is what he did, Rusty, in the last frame. Well, he's in the same situation with two guys on. He got a ball up in the zone, and he did not miss. I can tell you that's a good feeling for a hitter. Get that ball up in the jet stream. Carried right over the right field wall. 
His seventh home run of the season, by far the biggest hit for Auburn in probably three weeks, seems and, like. And my partner, Rusty Enzer, 29 home runs in his first in his two years in 1981 and 1982 with the Tennessee Volunteers in the SEC. And first volunteer hitter with 10-plus in back-to-back seasons. Hit one of them here, as a matter of fact. And in Atlanta. Yep, and this, on this field. Looked different. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Jim Morris was actually the the coach for Georgia Tech, who went on to have, uh, obviously, an outstanding career at Miami, just retired. Don't know if that one got skills or not. Skills took one off the non-throwing hand earlier on a pitch. Home plate umpire Jeff Hendricks is going to help him out a little bit. Clip the maybe the right inside of his leg, possibly. Whew. It's a tough position. It's got to be tough to play that play behind the dish. Williams foul to the screen behind the plate. His three-run home run in the fourth inning. His seventh home run on the year. You will see Kyle McCann of Georgia Tech tonight, number three national seed, Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, hosting Florida A&M, the Rattlers out of the MEAC. McCann had 23 home runs during the year. Williams stays alive. A run across, Julian the lead runner at third base. And Rankin Woolley, now two RBIs in the game, takes his leadoff first, held on by Zach Bierman. Both teams into the bullpen on day one. Lane's Butch Thompson telling us, was hoping to extend him a little bit further, but understanding the situation of the game and how he has used his pitcher throughout the course of the year. Served in the center field, coming on as Shavers. That's going to fall in for a base hit. Edouard Julian will score. Rankin Woolley moves up to second. Four RBIs for Williams. Well, again, a great piece of hitting and showing some nice versatility and some nice mechanics after the three-run home run, the two-strike pitch. He fights it off, gets just enough to drive in the run. It's a huge eighth run and a two spot for Auburn in this bottom of the fifth after putting up four in the bottom of the fourth. Case and Hal is grounded to short and lined to right, 0 for 2. A couple of walks and two base hits that have plated runs here against Matt Erdenson for the Tigers. Auburn has not trailed in this ball game. Coastal tied it at two on a home run, a solo shot in the fourth inning. That off the bat of Parker Shavers. Auburn since then, six unanswered runs. Looking for more, and Kaysen Howe swings over the top, down in the count, 0-2. Towards third base, Coney Glove steps on the bag at third, goes across a diamond, and the inning is over. Double play ends the inning, two across for Auburn, and the Tigers take an 8-2 lead to the sixth. Well, that was eight days ago in Hoover. The guts pulled out. That's what Butch Thompson has alluded to over the last couple of years. One went away from Omaha. A year ago, lost in Gainesville in game three against the Gators. That was in the SEC tournament a week ago yesterday. 4-3 loss against the LSU Tigers. Cody Greenhill was tagged with a loss in that game. Brooks Fuller was on the mound. 
when the two runs scored for the LSU Tigers. Bats certainly have come alive today compared to what Auburn went through in the three games at the SEC tournament. But I'll tell you, Steve, you can watch this game for a long time and never see that happen again. Auburn in the tournament at Hoover beat Tennessee, then lost to Vanderbilt 11-1 in eight innings. And then in the elimination game against LSU, losing by a run. Third strikeout for Elliott Anderson since entering the game in the fourth inning. One down here in the Coastal sixth. As Shavers is retired, Scott McKeon one for two will stand in for the Chanticleers. All you're thinking about is if you're Elliott Anderson right now, your team's starting to find some momentum offensively, throw up some zeros, throw some strikes, just attack the zone, let your defense work behind you. McKeon grounded out to first in his last at bat. When you throw strike one, the game is just a lot easier. Anderson entered the ball game with two outs and a runner on in the fourth inning. Hit Corey Wood, but then struck out Keaton Rivers, worked a 1-2-3 fifth. Looking to put McKeon away, ahead nothing to two. Good miss there, did not chase. How much as a head coach, how much as a coaching staff in a game like this right now where it's a six-run ball game because both sides will look ahead to Saturday. Coastal might be looking at it from a different vantage point facing an elimination game. But are you? can you start? You can't completely look ahead, but you can sort of finagle to say, okay, our options for the rest of this game give us these options going forward after this one is complete. I think both of these head coaches are going to do whatever they have to do to win this game. I don't think you start thinking about tomorrow until after this game is over. Look at that pick up. That is pretty sweet by Will Holland at shortstop. That is not an easy play, but that's some nice soft hands. SEC in 2019 had some terrific shortstops and Holland one of them. Yeah, look at this right here. Boom. Nice little pickup. Plenty of time to throw it over there to Woolley at first. Two outs and Mike Koenig go for two at the plate. Now that's something else that can help your offense. Make the routine defensive plays. Don't put any, any extra pressure on your pitching staff. With a six-run lead, you don't want to give the other team extra outs for sure. ESPN's Keith Law has Will Holland ranked as a number 59 top 100 draft prospect. His latest... Mock Draft 2.0 is up on ESPN.com, and the draft starts on Monday. We talked about Casey Mize earlier going 1-1. One one. First round, first overall last year out of Auburn, and we'll touch on it during the course of the weekend. And there are conversations about the possibility of moving the draft. Head coaches are big proponents at the college level. They don't have really a big say in it right now, but the draft day one is Monday, which could be the final day of the regionals with game sevens. And we had it last year, Nick Belmonte and I, in Gainesville, you had Brady Singer, you had Jackson Kowar on the other side for Florida Atlantic in a game seven, Jonathan you had India. Jonathan India, and you had Tyler Flank, uh, Tyler Frank, pardon me, for Florida Atlantic. All were drafted on that first night. Towards third, trying to pick it was Julian, unable to do so, and Holland will track it down in a two out base runner for the Chanticleers. I think if Julian had to do that over again, he probably takes a half step back and gets a little bit more of a bigger hop right here. A little bit too much of a hurry, I think. It's a tough play either way. They're going to rule that an error, it looks like. Julian is 11th error on the season. Auburn, 974 fielding percentage. 
in 2019. Let's see if Coastal can capitalize here and take advantage. Down 8-2, a two-out base runner on the error. Cameron Piercy has grounded out to short and singled for the Chanticleers. Yeah, that eight, that fielding percentage is just eighth best in the SEC. So making the plays really important for this Auburn team. Bliss. Flips to Holland, inning over. No runs, no hits, and Aaron Mann left on. Middle of the six. Auburn leading 8-2. For more coverage of the Division I Baseball Regionals and interactive brackets, go to NCAA.com. 8-2 ball game, Auburn leading. This is the Atlanta Regional matched up against the Chapel Hill Regional, the Tar Heels hosting. You see the matchups there. North Carolina, UNC Wilmington, Liberty, and Tennessee. The Vols. My partner, Rusty Enzer, former volunteer. And the Vols are back in. Yeah, first time in the tournament since 2005. Liberty actually has the most wins of any of the three other teams in the field, 42. Coached by Scott Jackson, a former assistant at North Carolina under Mike Fox. And if Chalk holds, you would have a potential North Carolina-Georgia Tech matchup in a super, and that would be a rematch of the ACC tournament championship game last Sunday, which was won by Carolina. New pitcher in the ball game for Coastal Carolina. They bring in left-hander Dylan Gentry. Gentry on for the 21st time. Does have two wins and a save, 25 strikeouts and 25 innings of work. Opponents hit 278 off the coastal lefty. Eight ACC teams in, but Duke and Florida State were two of the last four in to the field of 64. Duke, Florida State, Michigan, TCU were the final four in when the field was announced on Memorial Day Monday. Texas State in the Sun Belt had the best regular season record, same conference as Coastal Carolina. Gary Gilmore was talking about the conference. This is their third year in the Sun Belt. And... Gary Gilmore, the want is to get every single year. Coastal and Troy were in from the Sun Belt last year. Ward out on strikes, one down here in the home sixth inning. But the want is to get to that point where you are three conferences every year. And Missouri Valley is that way this year with Illinois State, Indiana State as a two seed, and Dallas Baptist in the Lubbock Regional. Those conferences get two, three, and you touched on it. These things help for future recruiting where players understand, not only am I going to a good team in a conference, but I'm going into a competitive conference yeah. that fields more than one or two teams. Well, and the Sun Belt has had uh, NCAA, you know, good NCAA regional teams in the past. Louisiana Lafayette, Troy has been to the tournament, uh, South Alabama. They've made some noise. So there you go right there, 10 from the SEC, 8 from the ACC. A lot of dominance in the southeast, a lot of regional host sites in this part of the country. You know, Butch Thompson, you know, this is interesting because, you know, playing in a regional for Auburn, very important, but playing in Atlanta, really important. It's a good recruiting base. When you think about it, Alabama is sandwiched between the state of Georgia and the state of Mississippi. And right now, you've got two schools that are hosting in Georgia and two schools that are hosting in the state of Mississippi. Connor Davis 0 for 3 has struck out twice in the ball game. Fouls that one at home plate. Veneciano, the starter, went four. Matt Erdenson gave up two and working the fifth inning, and now Dylan Gentry. 8-2 ball game. Auburn has not trailed at any point. 
trying to advance to the winner's bracket on Saturday to face either number three national seed Georgia Tech and the host Yellow Jackets or Florida A&M. This one will hit to left center field. Shavers going back. He'll look up, and this one is gone. Solo home run, Connor Davis. Auburn adds on to its lead. Well, the team that we've talked about hitting all the home runs at the beginning of this broadcast, Steve, has been... Coastal Carolina with 88 on the year, but Auburn flexing its muscles. Ball up in the zone. You see Connor Davis. He's coming in average-wise, the highest average hitter, batting average in the Auburn lineup. Just went yard to left center field. Tack on another run. That's his seventh on the year to Ty Williams for the team lead. Excuse me, Julian has eight. That's the team lead. Well, Holland 0 for 1, two walks, two runs scored. Gentry striking out the first two batters of the inning, missed with his location in a big way. Letter high. Connor Davis was all over it. This one stroked in the left center field for a base hit. Holland aboard for the third time. Well, Holland, Julian, Williams, whatever the routine was before the game, whatever they did for breakfast, do it again tomorrow and repeat. Matt Scheffler, one out of three with an RBI base hit back in the two-run first inning for Auburn. Up and down the lineup. They have had base runners in every inning except the second and third. And Adding on here in the sixth inning on a two-out shot off the bat of Connor Davis. That one hits Scheffler, and that puts two runners on with two down. Well, nine runs by Auburn. Steve, that's the most run this the Tigers have put on the board you have to go all the way back to May 5th. They beat Alabama. That was in game three of that three-game series. Beat the Tide 17-7. to Edouard Julian, a base hit, and two official at-bats. He's also walked and scored two runs. Auburn as a team entering the tournament averaging just over five and a half per game. And Butch Thompson said yesterday, we'll play close games, we'll play low scoring tight ball games, and we'll get blown out every once in a while. But we really don't run away from the opposing team all that often. And right now they're doing just that. And I think coming into this game, I think Butch Thompson thought, we, we got to score some runs to beat this team. And so far the pitching staff has done a really good job just – Slowing Coastal down to just a pair. But, again, they can explode at any time with 88 home runs on the season. But so far, so good for Auburn. Called strike three. Three strikeouts in the inning for Gentry. But Davis with a solo home run, giving Auburn a 9-2 lead as we go to the seventh. Welcome back to the NCAA Baseball Regionals presented by Capital One. Steve Lennox, Rusty Enzer, day one of the Atlanta Regional, our game summary. Auburn two in the first inning against Coastal starter Anthony Veneziano. Chanticleers tied it up on a solo home run in the fourth, but then Auburn a four spot in the bottom of the fourth inning, highlighted by a three-run home run by Stephen Williams, and they have tacked on since that four-run fourth inning. 
Back to work on the mound is Elliot Anderson working in relief for the Tigers on this beautiful Friday afternoon in Atlanta, Georgia. Breeze has picked up somewhat, and a brisk breeze across the diamond from left field to right field. Beautiful afternoon. This is a nice ballpark behind home plate. If you're in one of the seats here at Russ Chandler Stadium, you've got the seat back and you've got some cover down the baselines above the dugouts here in the bleachers and taking in the sun. Corey Wood, a base hit and two official at-bats, a double to start things off in the third. Hit by a pitch by Anderson in the fourth inning. Corey Wood was the first batter to face Elliott Anderson in relief of Jack Owen, the starter. Picks up a strikeout, one out here in the seventh. And Keaton Rivers will stand in. Georgia Tech, Florida A&M, first pitch scheduled for 7 p.m. Eastern. Game on the ESPN app. Great time of year if you're a fan of college baseball. Fastball up from Elliott Anderson. Anderson has been that guy who touched on his win total earlier in giving his numbers out of the bullpen in situations like this. All of a sudden, you're in before the fifth inning. Team gets the lead. They add on towards third base and foul. Anderson is a guy in this situation. You could see him possibly finishing this one out. And if that's the case, Auburn puts itself in a tremendous spot going into Saturday. Of no course, doubt. if you do use him, then perhaps you lose him for the rest of the weekend or you know, maybe Sunday or Monday he'd be available. Well, right now, Elliot Anderson doing a phenomenal job on the bump for Auburn. Mostly a fastball slider guy. Does throw a split. As I mentioned, kind of a hybrid guy. He can start or relieve. Thinking he's given his better outings out of the bullpen. 88 to 92 on that fastball. It's got some good arm side run. Gives up his first walk of the ball game. Again, Georgia Tech, number three national seed. In the field of 64, facing Florida AM tonight, Tristan English is one of their top players. He is a two-way player, named as a finalist for the John Olerud Two-Way Player of the Year. You see his numbers on the offensive side, and he's a guy who will get the final outs for Danny Hall and the Yellow Jackets in the eighth and ninth innings of ball games. A one-out base runner, Jake Wright, one for two. He's been on base twice with a single and a walk. Good pitch there, and for a strike. Florida A&M won the MEAC, similar to Coastal Carolina. They did not make it easy on themselves. The Rattlers won four games in two days, including two to close out and win the MEAC. But they've had more time off than Coastal Carolina, Auburn. Their conference tournament was the weekend before Everyone else really got underway last week in the early stages. Patriot League was another conference that wrapped up. Army beating Navy. They were in that first weekend after the regular season wrapped for some conferences around the country. Elliot Anderson working to Jake Wright. Lefty came on and got the final out in the fourth. Now speaking of tournament play, Jake Wright had an outstanding tournament. And the Sun Belt had four runs driven again against UT Arlington. Drove in five against Louisiana Monroe. Hit a pair of home runs. A 
up and down the lineup for Coastal during the course of the Sun Belt tournament that they hosted. The bats helped get them to this point because they were the fifth seat. Yeah, no doubt. In the tournament. Number one in batting average in the Sun Belt, but just ninth in, in uh, team ERA and tenth in fielding. So they do it the exact opposite of, that a lot of teams. They do it with offense. And going into the year, they thought those would be their strengths. And, and, here, and here's something else unusual. They, they, they led the league in home runs, but they also were second in the league in sack bunts. And that's something Gary Gilmore takes great pride in. Take a look at the Atlanta Regional, Auburn Coastal Carolina right here on day one, Georgia Tech, Florida A&M, 7 p.m. Eastern. It could wrap up on Sunday with the late game. You need three wins to advance to the Super Regional round. And Sunday, the team can even it up and pick up a win against the 2-0 team that would force a seventh and final game on Monday. But that seventh game is if necessary. Steve Smith going out to the mound to pay a visit to Elliot Anderson issuing back-to-back one-out walks. And this is where things start to get interesting. You have Bierman was struck out three times in the ball game. But a guy who can easily launch one out of the ballpark and puts a three-run shot here in the seventh inning. Now all of a sudden they get base runners and they're one swing away from tying it up in a situation if it can present itself. Swing and a miss, nothing in one. They have really stuck to the game plan against Beerman, Rusty. Yeah, I mean, just keeping him off balance, it's been it's been a struggle for Zach Bierman so far today. But the seventh inning, they've been able to make that magical. Coastal has this year. Fly ball, right field. Williams going back at the wall, jumps, and it is gone. Williams crashed into the wall, slow to get up. Bierman a three-run shot, and just like that, Coastal has life. Well, I mentioned the seventh inning has been the one that's been the most important. That's now 71 runs that Coastal has scored in the seventh inning this season. That's the most of any inning. And so that's been the inning that has cut a lead or expanded a lead. And after three straight punch outs, Zach Bierman flexing his muscles. That's his 18th long ball on the season. And he didn't know if it was gone or not. At first, I thought that Stephen Williams made the catch. Just snuck over that yellow line at the top of the wall. That's a huge three runs right there for Coastal. And that chases Elliott Anderson from the ball game. Another look at the three-run shot by Zach Bierman. We've got a 9-5 ball game here in Atlanta. Beerman, just like he did in the conference tournament, going deep. Auburn up 9-5 on Coastal Carolina. Zach Beerman just hitting a three-run home run. We take another look at this. I mean, you talk about a game of inches. This ball is in the glove of Stephen Williams, but... When he collides, when his wrist collides with the top of that wall, he loses his glove. The ball is in it. That's the reason why Zach Bierman hit a three-run home run. He couldn't bring the glove back in. Wow. Anderson, two and two-thirds, three runs, one hit allowed. That was a three-run home run. He's chased from the ball game. And Kyle Skeels, one out of three, will face Ryan Watson, the new Auburn pitcher. How do you get his glove back? There is a (laughs) little walkway back there wide enough to get a golf cart through. There's a path. Somebody might have been back there. I'll tell you what, during the course of an inning, I would not stand back there because you could absolutely get drilled. I guarantee you, 
nobody in the coastal bullpen <laughs> wanted just to go out the there same and help thing. Him. Yeah, no way. <laughs> Hey, yeah, this gate's locked over here. <laughs> Ryan Watson's on for the 12th time this year. Trying to snuff out a rally here in the top of the seventh. We've got a four-run ball game. And Beerman, three strikeouts and a three-run home run to follow those three punch-outs in the game. He had a walk-off. Watching video, a video on social media in the Sun Belt Conference tournament that we've been alluding to. And uh, they tore his jersey almost completely off. And Mike Rooney would like the, what do we call it, the flow, the hair. <laughs> Chris Burke also is a big fan. He had almost, uh, it almost looked like a wrestler entering into the ring, you know, all wet and all slicked back. Auburn up 9-5 on Coastal Carolina. That one misses inside. Owen Anderson and now Watson. It was a 9-2 ball game. It's now a 9-5 ball game. And we've been alluding to it. Coastal, you just have to continue to add on against the Chanticleers. That one spoiled foul. Anderson retired. The leadoff man got wood on a strikeout but then really ran into trouble. He walked Rivers, he walked right, and then Beerman made him pay. Fouled at home plate. Well, we've seen Skeels get hit a couple of times behind the plate catching and not helping himself there. If anybody can use some love right now. The left wrist, the inner right thigh, and now the, the right, right knee. Right, right knee or right shin, one of those. Someone else on the bus ride back to the hotel later might say, hey, I need ice, and oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> now I think the front shoulder. No one else is going to be able to ice after the game for Coastal. The boo-boos are adding up. I think that's off the, is that off the right wrist? Wow. Skills a base runner. And Watson following Anderson, hitting the first batter that he faces after entering the ball game. Here's Parker Shavers who homered a solo shot back in the fourth at the time. It tied the game up at two and two. Now remember, this is the kid from Montgomery, Alabama, who had hopes of playing for the Auburn Tigers. Had ten hits in the Sun Belt Tournament. Hit safely in seven of his last eight games with that 14th home run that he hit back in the fourth. Takes a strike. Behind in the count, no balls and two strikes. Just one out in the inning. Fans below us, back behind home plate. Want the scoreboard change? It says 1-1 for the count. Fans don't miss a lot, do they? That's, these guys are in the game. Now it's correct on the scoreboard, one and two on Shavers. Skills the runner at first base, one down and three across for Coastal Carolina. There were three noon starts, noon Eastern, Campbell, North Carolina State, and in the Athens Regional, Florida State, Florida Atlantic. Owls and the Seminoles in Athens, down and away. Shavers down in the count, 0-2. Count now even at 2-2. Two and two.
He's got room to work with on the right side as a left-handed batter with Rankin Woolley holding the runner on. Full count. Well, I'll tell you, Auburn's got a four-run lead, Steve, but there's a lot of nervous people in that Tiger dugout. At one point, up 9-2, and you thought Cody Greenhill Saturday and or Sunday. Now you might think Greenhill for the eighth and ninth. And what has turned into a four-run ball game in Coastal batting here was still just one out. Two outs in the inning. Watson wins the battle against Shavers. Huge, huge strikeout right there by Ryan Watson. Again, elevating that fastball to get that big second out on a punch out. Scott McKeon, one out of three. Single back in the second against starter Jack Owen. Coastal Carolina has left seven runners on base so far in the game. Little flare into right field. Williams coming on, makes a catch, let her high, and the inning is over. Beerman a three-run home run. We've got ourselves a ball game, seventh inning stretch time in Atlanta. Regionals is presented by Capital One. What's in your wallet? And in part by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Your adventure starts here. And Twix. It's time to decide. Bottom half of the seventh inning, Auburn Tigers up 9-5 on Coastal Carolina. Steve Lennox, Rusty Enzer, former volunteer, played for the Vols back in 1981-1982. Dylan Gentry back out on the mound. And Rankin <laughs> Woolley, ooh, boy, oh boy, you have to feel for Kyle Skeels. We put home run packages together, strikeout packages together. Hint, hint, hint. Is that five? That's five, yeah. Two behind the plate. Two, two at home plate. He got hit in the top of the inning. And now another one. Right off the bicep, it looks like. Telling you. I played in the game today for Coastal Carolina. Pitcher, position player, outside of skills. I'm not asking for ice. <laughs> I don't no. know about you, but I'll wait in line. Wally out on strikes. Back-to-back -back strikeouts for Dylan Gentry. Strikeout three in the last inning. But in between the three strikeouts, a home run by Davis, and he hit a batter and also gave up a single. And here is Steven Williams, two base hits, three-run home run, RBI single, four RBIs for Williams, now 27 on the year. Well off what he did as a freshman with the Auburn Tigers and the SEC. This young man is a terrific talent. So you look at the numbers as a sophomore year. Did he hold up? No, his own plate umpire, Jeff Hendricks. Next year would be his draft year. I don't believe he's draft eligible as a sophomore. Gentry deals. A strike. And it's quickly one and two on Williams. Wow. You'd anticipate him going out, playing somewhere, maybe even on the Cape this summer. Cues one foul, third base side. Wood Bat League somewhere across the country. Get his at-bats in. Yep. Do, do a little bit of prep work for next year. Into left center field. He's aboard with his third hit of the ball game. And a 2020 season for Auburn that kicks off with a three-game series against UCLA and Los Angeles. Butch Thompson was telling us about that. Georgia Tech, who we'll see tonight. 
opened up early on in the year against UCLA back in February here in Atlanta. Kaysen Howell at the plate, headed into an inning-ending double play in his last at bat in the fifth. He is the only Auburn hitter in the starting nine on the lineup card who has not reached with a hit or a walk in this ball game. Williams now has three base hits. Twelve hits total for the Auburn Tigers. Butch Thompson and Steve Smith, you want as close to clean innings as you can get for the final six outs of the ball game to really go away from here today feeling good about yourselves. The bats have come alive. If you've given up a total of five runs against a Coastal Carolina lineup that lights up scoreboards, it's a good day. Base hit for Kaysen Howe. Two on with one down. Howe has reached for the first time in this ball game. 13 hits total for the Tigers now. And back to the top for Judd Ward, who has two base hits and four official at-bats. Dylan Gentry to the left-handed batter, Ward. Got the first batter of the inning, and last inning ran into trouble after striking up the first two hitters. Balls behind, 2-0. Ward's got to look for something on the pool side right here. Count leverage. Three ball, no strike count. Definitely got to take here. What guys don't do that I would like to see more of at 3-0, and you know it's a take. You spread out just a little bit wider in the in the batter's box. Crouch just a little bit. Don't make it obvious to the umpire. Just shrink that strike zone a little bit. Just above the belt for a called strike. 9-5 ball game. Auburn has scored in each of the previous three innings. Swing and a foul tip. Catcher Skeels holds on. Three and two the count on Judd Ward. Auburn Tigers trying to advance to the winner's bracket on Saturday. They have not trailed in this ball game at any point. One of 16 regionals around the nation starting on this last day of May. Ball four and the bases are loaded. Williams to third base, Hal moves to second. And Ward the leadoff man on for the third time. And Ryan Bliss will come to the plate. He has a base hit and three at bats. He's also walked once. And Drew Thomas is out of the first base dugout paying a visit to the mound. There has been activity for Coastal Carolina and they are going to the pen Coastal with a new pitcher on the mound, entering with the bases loaded and one out in the seventh when we come back. The road to Omaha has begun here in Atlanta and other 15 regionals around the nation. The last five national champions, Vandy in 2014, Coastal playing against Auburn this afternoon here at Russ Chandler. Florida in 2017, Oregon State last year winning and the Oregon State team winning six elimination games in Omaha, their third title in school history. 
New pitcher in the ball game for Coastal Carolina South, uh, sophomore Zach McCamley is now on. He is the fourth pitcher used by the Chanticleers today on day one. 6-1-2-0-5 is McCambly on for the 22nd time. He does have six wins on the season and a save. He's struck out 75 batters in just 66 and two-thirds innings, but opponents hit 277 off of the right-hander. Enters with the bases loaded, one down, 9-5 ball game. Coastal with the infield up on the corners at first and third. They're back up the middle with one down. Ryan Bliss, a base hit and a walk, one for three. Lines one to left field for a base hit. This is going to score two, and the Tigers add on once again and provide their pitching staff with some breathing room. Bliss picks up RBIs 33 and 34 on the year. It's a great piece of hitting, and I love the aggressiveness by the freshman, second baseman, Ryan Bliss. When you come to bat with runners in scoring position, ten, you know, typically you're going to get a fastball, something in the strike zone. I like the aggressiveness, even with the, with the new pitcher, goes after the first pitch, drives in two more runs. And it's Hal a- got a good read off the bat. From second base, he was right on the heels of Stephen Williams, who sort of broke back and then stumbled a bit. Auburn has now scored in four straight innings. Here's Davis, who had a two-out home run, a solo shot in the last inning. That off Dylan Gentry. Went too far, fooled on that offering from McCambly. Boniziano. Erdinson, Gentry, McCambly. A lot of syllables in there for the four pitchers. I'm not even going to try to count right now. <laughs> Still just one out in the inning. Did he go? Yes, says the first base umpire, Matt Anderson. Auburn fans do not agree. That's close. Four straight batters have reached in the inning. Towards third and foul. Up into the seats, past the dugout. Tigers... Eight wins, just one loss when scoring 10 or more this year. So trying to close this one out. Up 9-2 until Bierman hit a three-run home run. Got some pretty good action on that pitch. Yeah, I was going to say, I'd be hugely surprised if Davis sees anything but that breaking ball. It's got some pretty good depth. He can snap it off, there's no doubt. McCamley has a sign. Ward, the lead runner, at second. Opposite way. Long run for Rivers towards the line. Reaches down, makes the catch. Ward will tag, and he'll move from second to third, and he's there with two outs. Davis retired. Davis there, pitching away, shows the ability to go to the opposite field. Well, look at the speed by Keaton Rivers, and look how much ground he covers all the way over to make the grab. He doesn't make that catch. I mean, that's a, that's a double for sure and another run by Auburn. But great piece of, of base running by Ward to be heads up and tag up and get to third base. He was able to put the brakes on as he crossed into foul territory down there on the warning track. Will Holland on base three times, a single, two walks, two runs scored in the cleanup spot. You describe that more of a slurve? 
Well, the first couple of times he snapped it off, yeah. it, I mean, it was – it had a lot more action on it than that one. Yeah, I think I, th- I think Auburn should be putting Bliss in motion. This guy's got great speed. You get another runner in scoring position, and even with two outs, you take the force play on a ball that's hitting the hole. You take the force play away, and, you know, Bliss is a guy – Stole 64 of 66 bags in high school. Locked by Skeels. Bliss will take off on the ball in the dirt, and he's into second base. Well, that'll work, too. Wild pitch charge to McCambly. I think you got to give Skeels a lot of credit right there getting out. He's had a ton of action today behind the plate. Great job of blocking that baseball and keeping Ward at third. Three ball, no strike count. Ball four to Holland. He's walked for the third time in this ball game and the bases are loaded for Matt Scheffler. Scheffler, an RBI base hit back in the two-run first inning for Auburn. Hit by a pitch in the sixth inning and was left stranded. Eighth batter to come to the plate in this inning for the Tigers. Bottom of the seventh, Auburn up six. At one point up 9-2 in this one. Coastal Carolina bullpen after the home run by Bierman in the top of the inning, Gentry and McCambly. A little bit of issue. There's the lead runner at third base. Ward, Bliss, terrific speed at second. And Holland, who just walked to keep the inning alive at first. Picks up the corner. And ahead two strikes on Scheffler. Auburn sent nine batters to the plate. In a four-run fourth inning, Williams had the big blow with a three-run shot. Steven Williams in the eighth spot in the lineup, three hits and four runs batted in. Skeels keeps that one at home plate. Swing and a miss. Inning is over. Two more runs for Auburn. Tigers up 11-5 when the shot to clears. Day one of the Atlanta Regional. Auburn up on Coastal Carolina. 11-5 Tigers. 11 runs on 14 base hits. Everyone in the lineup for the Tigers with at least a hit or a walk in this one. Our next UFC fight night is on ESPN2 Saturday with Alexander Gustafsson and Anthony Smith in a highly anticipated light heavyweight main event from Stockholm, Sweden. Gustafsson's hometown with the winner heading back into title contention. 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Plus in English and Spanish with the prelims starting at 10 a.m. Eastern. Start your free trial today by downloading the ESPN app or visiting ESPNplus.com. Coastal Carolina will have a pinch hitter. Nick Lucky will hit for Mike Koenig here in the eighth inning in a six-run ball game. Young man from Denver, PA. First at bat of the 2019 regional. Koenig went 0 for 3 at the plate, did reach on an error in the sixth inning. Well, Auburn offensively tacking on. Four in the fourth and adding on to it, 
still provide some insurance for the bullpen. Owen, Anderson, and Watson. Watson got the final two outs in the last inning, hit the leadoff batter in the first batter that he faced, actually, in relief of Anderson, who would be in line for the win at this point in the ball game. Well, those two runs in the bottom of the last inning, important for Auburn in a couple of ways because, number one, it obviously gave him a little bit of breathing room, but it could potentially keep Cody Greenhill out of this game, which would be really important. Greenhill is Auburn's closer. Gary Gilmore goes back to his bench once again, and Jared Johnson is going to pinch hit for Cameron Piercy. So Johnson, left-handed batter, leadoff walk to Nick Lucky. Right now, if you're once and you want outs. Pitch to contact, attack the strike zone, let your teammates work behind you. One ball, one strike count on Jared Johnson. Corey Wood, the leadoff man on deck. Already announced sellout crowd for tonight's game two on day one here in Atlanta. Host Georgia Tech, the number three national seed in Florida A&M out of the MEAC. Seven Eastern on the ESPN app. Foul outside of first base. Well, if they can keep this a lead of six runs or more and get the final six outs, if you talk with Butch Thompson and Steve Smith, I wonder how close they were to thinking about getting Greenhill up and getting him in the bullpen at some point and warming up. Right now, not needed. A couple of base runners might be a different story. Again towards first and foul, handled by... Kevin Schnall now in his 16th year on the staff at Coastal. Touched on it earlier. Gary Gilmore. Assistants will come and go, and especially as we touched on with the unpaid volunteer assistant, those guys are going to go for other options. But the guys who are on staff and paid assistants, you can keep those guys intact. Build the foundation. Pitch misses up and away to Johnson. Stability, very important. And sometimes in in this day and age, patience is something that fans, athletic directors don't have. I think you could score about 90 miles, 80 miles from here or so and on the campus of the University of Georgia, and look what Scott Strickland has done in six years. But his first four were less than impressive. I don't think he won more than 11 SEC games, under 500 in in league play each of those years, and now he's back-to-back regional hosts. There have been – there's been plenty of turnover over the last couple of years. Already schools are looking to make moves, and, of course, you have that trickle-down effect, and – Florida State will have a decision to make. They'll go through the process after their year is complete with Mike Martin retiring after 40 years. And that will create the opening. Someone might get a job that's currently open. Long Beach State is open. Oregon's open. Some, so some big jobs. Third base side and foul off the bat of Wood. Mike Martin and the Seminoles in the NCAA tournament field for a 42nd straight year, 40th straight year under 11. And you see the resume. He will retire after the year is over. Seminoles right now leading Florida Atlantic 12-7 in game one of the Athens Regional. They're going to need a couple more wins to get to 40 this year. But that is impressive. 40-plus wins every year he's been the head coach. Took over for Dick Hauser. You know, t- talking about coaching hires, you know, the SEC 
you know, before the last couple of years, the last two assistant coaches that were hired to be head coaches were Kevin O'Sullivan and Tim Corbin, who were both assistants at Clemson that went to Florida and Vanderbilt, respectively. And then you had Butch Thompson, who was an assistant at, at Mississippi State, get the Auburn job. Tony Vitello got the Tennessee job, who was an assistant at Arkansas. Nick Mangione, who was an assistant at Mississippi State, got the Kentucky job. Last year, when there was an opening at Mississippi State, they turned to a sitting head coach and Chris Lamonis at Indiana. But it'll be interesting to see how some of the some of the assistants at, at bigger time Power Five conferences, what kind of looks they get throughout the country. Called strike three, back-to-back strikeouts after the leadoff walk for Ryan Watson. It's got to be, if the one is there to coach, you aspire to coach, you'll leave as an assistant in an SEC school. But you've really got to you, you, you got to have a situation that fits you. And, yeah. and as an SEC assistant, you can say, you know what, it's not my time yet. And you're in a good situation where you're at with an SEC school. And you can continue to build on the resume. Yeah, I mean, with Butch Thompson, I mean, he was – he had his dream job. He always wanted to be the pitching coach at Mississippi State. He grew up in that state, and he was right where he wanted to be. Now, he interviewed for the job when Sonny Galloway was hired by Auburn. But when he was when he got the head job after Galloway was uh, let go, it was an, an unusual time. It was in October, and it was right after fall practice had ended both for Auburn and Mississippi State. And so really this is – so when he joined his club in the, the first year, four years ago, I mean, that first year was very difficult because he didn't have fall practice. They, you know, they didn't really see his team on the field until, you know, fall practice started the middle of January. Bliss on the backhand. Holland wins the foot race to the bag. And that will do it for Coastal here in the eighth inning as they strand a base runner. We go to the bottom half of the eighth. Auburn up 11-5 here on day one of the Atlanta Regional. The ESPN Networks bring you every game on the road to Omaha, starting with regional coverage on ESPN2, ESPNU, the SEC Network, and ESPN3. Whip Around coverage is also available through ESPN3 and the Bases Loaded channel. All coverage is available on the ESPN app. Home eighth inning, Trevor Damron is now on for Coastal Carolina. Damron, left-handed pitcher, and the fifth used today by Gary Gilmore. Sophomore from Amherst, Ohio. On for the 21st time, he does have two wins on the season. 45 strikeouts and just 33 and two-thirds innings of work. 19 walks, opponents hit 266 off of the Coastal Carolina lefty. Gary Gilmore went to the bench in the top of the inning for two pinch hitters. They both remain in the game. Damron is going to face Julian to start things off. Lucky stays in the ball game. He's at the hot corner playing third. And the new left fielder in the ball game as Julian stands in. Skills the catcher. It's indicating he wanted the signs as they're ready to go to work. Julian, a base hit, a walk, two runs scored. Facing a left-hander once again. Veneziano went four, gave up six runs on seven base hits. Auburn has done a fantastic job in this ball game, adding on after going in front once again with a four-run fourth. Auburn's best offensive output in almost a month. You have to go all the way back to May the 5th. That was the third of a three-game series against Alabama. Tigers scored 17 runs on 19 hits. They have uh, 14 hits today. A 
Every hitter in the starting lineup with at least one. It's good balance. That's good news if you're Butch Thompson and the Auburn coaching staff for sure. That will be a talking point. Auburn bats coming alive against Coastal Carolina pitching. Can they maintain that? And what can Tanner Burns do if Auburn is able to secure the final three outs in this one and play in the winner's bracket on Saturday? Because we were told yesterday, anticipated that Burns will get the game two start for the Tigers. Julian on base for the third time in this one. His second time reaching with a free pass. And Rankin Woolley will stand in. Well, he has two base hits, two RBIs. He's also struck out on two occasions. First pitch strike thrown by Trevor Damron. Tanner Burns, talented sophomore. There's an arm that they are going to take care of. during his stint here at Auburn. He's a sophomore, and he was drafted out of high school by the New York Yankees organization, I think somewhere in the 30s in terms of round. But, you know, he had already indicated that his plan was to go to Auburn, play for Butch Thompson. Chopper towards short. McKeon right through him into the left field. Julian to third. He'll stop there. And a first and third, no out situation for the Tigers. I don't think that ball was hit hard enough where he should have been thinking two. No, I don't think he was thinking two. He was trying to throw out Woolley at first base. But the first thing you got to do before you can make the throw, you got to field it. And it just snuck underneath his glove. I mentioned earlier. Coastal 10th in the Sun Belt and fielding just at a 962 clip. Williams, three hits, four RBIs, first and third, and nobody out. Has a brief conversation with Jeff Hendricks, the home plate umpire. Three times in this ball game, Julian has gone first to third. And that was an error, but again, the play was in front of him, hit to the left side, but base hits earlier in the game, first to third. I've been impressed with his ability to run the bases in those situations. He's given himself an opportunity to take that extra base. One ball, two strike count on Steven Williams. Well, it's an easy read. Because right. the ball's hit, you know, the, the play's in front of you, so you don't really need your third base coach, but you're right. Aggressive base running, and Auburn has been very, very aggressive on the bases today, and it's made a difference in this game. So often, folks may not realize, but it's the start that you get that allows you – to get into that situation where you can take the extra base. You don't get off to a good start. And in Julian's case, the last three times in this ball game, going first to third, he's gotten good breaks and gotten good reads. And as you said, that ball, another ball earlier in front of him where he can make the read and make the decision. And it was a slow hit ball too, a kind of a little bit of a kind of a topped it. So the ball, you know, wasn't hit on the line, so he could make the read easy and, and make the turnaround second, take that extra 90 feet. Williams entered this ball game just four hits in his previous 30 at-bats. That included the games in the SEC tournament where he didn't start in one of the games for the first time this year. But three hits, four RBIs. He has scored twice. We have had a lot of 3-2 counts in this ball game. And really, just about every pitcher, even though the relievers coming in with runners on base, they've kept 
pretty good pace. None of these pitchers used by either team so far have slowed things down to a crawl. Might have gotten close a couple of occasions. Williams stays alive. Making Damron work. Opportunity for Auburn to score in a fifth straight inning. Base hit through the left side. Have a day, Stephen Williams. Four hits, five runs batted in. Well, not only have a day, but have an approach. On the pool side, he hits the three-run home run back in the fourth. But watch him use the back side of the field. Balls on the black on the outside portion of the plate. Drives that front shoulder, keeps it closed. That is a textbook job of hitting. If he does more of that, he will improve immensely as a hitter. And he's going to play for a long time. Yep. Three straight batters have reached. Case in Hal, a base hit in his last at bat, scored in the seventh. Breaking ball stays high. There's a difference between being considered a power hitter and a hitter with power. That's a prime example of being a hitter with power. It's interesting, power hitters, it used to be they'd be all pull, but power hitters now on that other side of what you're talking about, they'll use the middle of the field more so than decades past. Chopper towards second. Wood to McKeon, back to first. It gets through Bierman. Coming in to score is Rankin Woolley. Throw down to second base, and in there safely is Howell. Out at second is Williams. That is the first out of the inning. And now two runs across. Taylor made double play ball. Ball just scoots underneath the glove of Bierman at first base. It's McKeon's second error of the inning. This one through the left side for a base hit off the bat of Judd Ward. Coming around third is Hal. He will come in to score. And Auburn continues to add on against Ashanta Clears. Ward picks up his third base hit of the ball game. Great piece of hitting again by Judd Ward. Going opposite field, left-on-left left matchup. That's what you have to do with the lefty. Just put the bat on the ball, find a hole, drive in another run. Auburn has scored in five straight innings. Three across here in the eighth inning. Ryan Briss, uh, Bliss, pardon me, at the plate. Has two base hits and a walk. How many batters in the lineup now have reached two or more? Asians in this ball game for Auburn. It's a pretty impressive number. Well, I can tell you that every batter has at least one base hit. We've got eight that. of the nine starters have scored a run, and it's been—I mean, it's been an offensive show by a team that, uh, quite frankly, for the last three weeks, have been really struggling to find some rhythm. But they have certainly found it here at Georgia Tech. Still just one out in the inning. Two errors. Rusty alluded to it. McKeon, the short snap has both of them here in the eighth. Yeah. 
Sharply hit, back through the middle, and a single in the center field off the bat of Ryan Bliss. His third hit of the ball game. Well, if you're Trevor Damron, it's you right now. Yeah, you're just taking one for the team right now. Both pen is quiet. Still just one out in the inning, but, I mean, right now Auburn's feeling nice and comfortable, and it's like they're taking BP right now. Connor Davis, one out of five, solo home run back in the sixth inning. Largest lead of the game for the Tigers. Sharply hit, foul down the side. Davis, a number three hitter, at the plate for a sixth time. This is the 40th at bat of the game for Auburn. Amron has a sign from Skeels. Opposite way to right field. Keaton Rivers going back. And Rivers is able to haul it in. The runners are going to tag up and move up 90 feet. Davis is retired for out number two. That's another great catch by Keaton Rivers in right. He is showing his versatility. We've talked about the way he handles the bat, but this guy can play some serious right field right up against the wall to make another nice catch. And again, Auburn with heads up base running, both runners tagging up on the play. I think just other than a couple of Pitching moments, I mean, it's been a complete game for Auburn. From, a, from an offensive standpoint, it's been almost perfect. Will Holland on base four times. He has singled and walked three times in this ball game. Eighth batter to come to the plate in this inning against Trevor Damron. Pours in a strike. And in a 14-5 ball game, Holland not happy with Jeff Hendricks, the home plate umpire. That pitch misses upstairs. I love guys, no matter what the score in a ball game, some guys will give up in a bat every once in a while. Some guys, no. That's my time at the plate. If I can get my base hit, yeah. I'm getting my base hit. Well, I mean, it's it's a team sport, but there's all, a lot of individuality to the sport because your job is to get a base hit. And listen, these guys are competitive. They don't want to give away an A-B. I've tried to explain that to eight. And then what turned out to be nine-year-olds and ten-year-olds. and <laughs> Tigers by the numbers. And impressive. 25 base runners. Wow. A lot of traffic. Holland has himself a base hit. This is going to play two. And the Tigers continue to dent the scoreboard here in Atlanta. See, Holland doesn't want to get up, give up in an A-B here in the bottom of the eighth inning. Good piece of hit. Good job of commanding the strike zone, driving in two more important runs. 16-5. to five. Matt Scheffler stands in, a base hit and a run batted in way back in the first. Since then, he has flied out, grounded out, and struck out. 
Ninth batter to come to the plate in this inning. Scheffler's the only guy in the lineup that hadn't scored a run today. Comes up empty. Julian, who again is on deck, he let off the inning with a walk. Has scored three times. Hall has scored a pair of runs. Towards shortstop, McKeon to second for the force out, inning over. We go to the ninth, Auburn three outs away from advancing to the winner's bracket here in Atlanta. It has been all Stephen Williams all the time today here in Atlanta, Rusty Enzer. I tell you, he has been a one-man wrecking crew. Four hits on the day. Stephen Williams has driven in five runs. The big blast was the three-run home run that he hit. And he is our Capital One player of the game. Five ribbies and he's used the entire field coming off of that three-run home run. Well-played game by the Auburn right fielder. Gary Gilmore will go to his bench for a third time and bring on a pinch hitter. As Morgan Hyde will have an at-bat, he'll hit for Jake Wright in the ninth inning. Ryan Watson asked to get the final three outs. Wide throw of first base and a leadoff base runner for Coastal Carolina here in the ninth inning. Goes an infield base hit for Morgan Hyde. Coming up after we get the final out here in Atlanta, base is loaded. And our next broadcast, 7 Eastern on the ESPN app. Florida A&M and Georgia Tech, the number three national seed. Another pinch hitter, and it will be Bradley Riopel who will stand in. Ryopel, pardon me. Ryopel will get in the bat. Fourth pinch hitter. Used by the Chanticleers. And a 16-5 ball game. Sharply hit towards second. Over Bliss in the right center field. Turning second, Hyde. He'll go to third. Going to second. And in there safely. Good hustle play by... Ryo Pell, and he is at second in a second and third situation for Coastal Carolina. Well, Ryo Pell wastes no time attacking Ryan Watson. Ball kind of takes a bad hop over the glove of Ryan Bliss, but I'm not sure about trying to turn a for sure single into a very, very close play at second base right here. Not what you want to do when you're down by 11 runs. That run right there doesn't mean anything. You need base runners. You don't want to run into an out right there. Dallas Callahan off the bench. Now the fifth pinch hitter for Coastal Carolina over the last couple of innings. Lucky and Pierce both pinch hit in the eighth inning for the Chanticleers. High the lead runner at third, Ryo Pell at second. Nobody out. And similar, Damron faced nine hitters in the last of the eighth inning. Ryan Watson, you want the three outs as quickly as you can get them, but last thing you want to do here is have to go back to the bullpen. Yeah. Infield back, certainly willing to exchange a run for an out. And it's been a little bit of a bad luck inning so far for Ryan Watson. Uh, you know, the, the, the ball that Hyde hit, Julian with a good throw, and he's out at first, and a little bit of a bad hop off the bat of Ryopel, which could have been a double play. One out here in the Coastal Carolina ninth inning. Parker Chavers will come to the plate. Chavers led off the fourth inning with a home run against Jack Owen. 
the starting pitcher for the Tigers. That tied the game up at 2-2. Two and two. And then Auburn going from there. This one foul to the top of the screen over the dugout. Tigers four runs in the fourth inning, two more in the fifth, a run in the sixth, two in the seventh, five runs in the eighth. Did not score in the second, did not score in the third. Opened up with a 2-0 lead after one. Butch Thompson. Two outs away from not needing his top reliever, Cody Greenhill, on day one. Greenhill, like Tanner Burns, who we're expecting in game two, a sophomore. Both of those guys following up great freshman years at the college level with strong sophomore campaigns. Cut on and missed. Shavers doesn't get cheated all that often. Thinking back, Williams with a great day at the plate and almost robbed Bierman of a home run. Lost the ball and the glove over the wall on Bierman's home run in the seventh inning. How about if you were able to add that to the highlight reel today? He was awfully yeah, close. I, I was thinking of that earlier. You're right. Could have been a Capital One player of the game and probably would have ended up on SportsCenter on a, on a top ten highlight with that with that effort. Called strike three, two down. Watson, after allowing the first two batters to reach, has struck out two in a row way to attack the zone and really fool Chavers. That's a fastball on the inside part of the plate with a little tail at the end to catch the corner. Chavers wasn't expecting that ball on the inner half and he knew it was a strike. Chavers since the home run striking out three straight at bats. And Bierman, who they lifted for a pinch hitter here in the night, struck out three times. Then he hit a three-run home run. McKeon at the plate, one out of four. Tigers one out away from advancing to the winner's bracket tomorrow. Georgia Tech, Florida A&M, 7 Eastern ESPN app. Rusty and I will have the call. We'll be here all weekend. Hope that's good news for you out there. I think it is. Maybe. Look out. That one off the glove of the catcher. It goes to the backstop. Hyde will score from third base. Coastal a run here in the ninth inning against Watson. And it will be a wild pitch. Ryo Pell now at third. Everyone making the adjustments at home plate. The same on the mound as Watson rubs up the baseball. To right field, base hit. Williams plays it on a hop. RBI single by McKeon as Ryo Pell scores from third. And it's a 16-7 ball game. Again, no matter what the situation, we saw Holland in the last inning. Yep. I've got one more opportunity. I'm going to go pick up a base hit. Hey, as long as you got an A-B, you might as well take advantage of it. That's a really a good piece of hitting. And by nice the, to see McKeon. from yeah. McKean after the two errors in the yep. last inning. That's exactly right. Comes back, goes opposite field. You know, Gary Gilmore using a lot of pinch hitters the last couple of innings, getting everybody some experience here in regional play. You just don't know who you might need tomorrow or Sunday. He's obviously not happy with his pitching staff's efforts today, but 
Again, his offense has put seven on the board. Came out of the loser's bracket in the Sun Belt Conference Tournament. And again, you know, Coastal plays sometimes in, in regional and super regional play, College World Series. They play better when it's an elimination <laughs> game. When they won the national championship, they won six elimination games on the way. Like Oregon State a year ago in Omaha. Runner goes, pitches inside. They give McKeon second base. They're ready to fire out of the third base dugout. One ball, two strike count. The pitch to Lunky. Chopper towards first base, backing up. Rankin Woolley throws to the pitcher, covering, and that's the ball game. Auburn Tigers, an impressive 16-7 win. They advance to the winner's bracket on Saturday. Stephen Williams, the big bat with four hits, five runs batted in. Connor Davis also with a home run as Auburn scores in the last five innings to pull away. So the Auburn Tigers will face either Florida A&M or Georgia Tech in the winner's bracket on Saturday. A look at the updated bracket. Our final score once again, 16-7. Tonight, 7 Eastern on the ESPN app is our second game from the Atlanta Regional, Florida A&M, and number three national seed, Georgia Tech. Coming up next, it's bases loaded. Again, the final, Auburn 16, Coastal Carolina 7. Goodbye from Atlanta. <laughs>